Good morning. Today is March 19, and uh, first item up will be uh, Ms. Moody and the public hearing. We'll follow it up with our employee recognition. Thank you so much, um, all you folks from Public Works. And then we're going to have our public comment, uh, all the people that have uh, signed up and anybody that hasn't signed up, and then we'll uh, jump into... Uh, the rest of our meeting. So that's what I have so far. And so at this time, I'm going to call up item 1A, public hearing order and resolution 0903 19-01 in the matter of adopting the FY18-19 supplemental budget number three, making, reducing, and transferring appropriations with us to discuss this issue this morning is Christine Moody, who is the budget and financial planning manager. And welcome, Ms. Moody. Good morning. Thank you, Chair Sorensen, uh, Commissioners. Um, so as mentioned, this is our third supplemental budget. I know that we have a couple commissioners where this is the first supplemental budget that you've had on the agenda. So I thought I'd cover just a little bit. Um, Oregon budget law allows us to amend our budget after we adopt it. We do that each year in June. Um, and so we have a plan to do them quarterly throughout the fiscal year. Um, Supplemental budgets are allowed if there is something unanticipated that comes up that we didn't know about um, during the budget process. There's also a requirement if you ever decrease appropriations that that has to be done through a supplemental budget. Um, so this morning, as was mentioned, we have a public hearing. That's required when we change the size of a fund by more than 10%. That is happening in our capital fund due to moving uh, funds out of reserves in order to purchase the old city hall lot. Um, so that is the big change that's causing the public hearing. Other than that, um, just to highlight a few changes for you, um, we are changing some FTE across multiple funds that I detailed in the memo for you. Some of them are technical fixes, um, some of them just additional revenue coming in, and so they've added FTE for the rest of the year. Um, we also have uh, a general fund transfer to Health uh, Human Services Division um, for the Dusk to Dawn expansion that happened this fall. Um, so those expenses have come in. We've been tracking that to move the general fund into that program to cover those. So I'm open for questions or public hearing first or however you want to proceed. Okay. Um, as we know, the uh, budget involves uh, various verbs. Uh, Mr. Mokohyski is getting ready to propose the next budget. Uh, the budget committee will then be working on that in May and they will approve the budget. Um, then the Board of Commissioners in June will adopt the budget and as we have today, the third of our, of our um, um, amending of the budget. So uh, is there anyone present that wants to speak at the public hearing on whether the board should or should not adopt the um, supplemental budget number three. So I will now open the public hearing. Seeing no one has uh, signed up, I will now close the public hearing, turn to the board for uh, action on this resolution. Commissioner Buck. Um, I move. <clears throat> Excuse me, I move to approve item 1A, resolution 19-03-19-01, matter of adopting the fiscal year 1819 supplemental budget number three, making, reducing, and transferring appropriations. Is there a second? Second. Okay, moved by Commissioner Buck, seconded by Commissioner Bozovich to approve the resolution as presented. Further discussion? Um, a couple of things. Under F, first bullet point, um, how much money are you moving from capital fund to complete the land purchase of the former city hall in the city of Eugene? The, uh, the total, let me, let me see here. Actually, that you can find that back in your order, the amount that's moved out of reserves because they would have had some appropriations. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so they are increasing uh, the appropriations in county administration. That's where the fund resides by 5.6 million. And, um, and forgive me, you're right. This is my first. Yes. Right. <laughs> um, and will that money be returned to um, contingency and reserves if the bond election is approved? Do we reimburse ourselves? Does the county reimburse itself in that line item if, in fact, the money is secured for the, the Justice Center? 
50 percent of the cost of the purchase um, is eligible for funding from the state. We've already been authorized for $6.4 million from in state funds for the project. Um, so 50% of the purchase price uh, will be funded by state funds. And then the question on the other 50% of the land purchase, whether or not that would be bond funds or capital resources. Right, it is part of the total project cost yeah. when we're giving that number, um, whether that ends up being needed yeah those just I'm to just give you an idea for the source of those funds how they get into the capital fund that is a depreciation charge that we charge all of our county funds that use facilities um so they've paid into that fund for improvements so there'll be some analysis on that probably board decision okay, i'm just curious mm -hmm. um and my second my last question is one of those bullets says increase you had said this is all increased county dues budget by 67,490 for Association of Oregon Counties as previously approved by the board. Correct. In that, I wasn't part of that previously, you know, approved by the board. Why do you, if it's been previously approved, why do you have to have an increase now? And forgive my naivete. No, that's fine. So the um, direction to make it happen and then having it happen in the board are two different steps. So we do have to do some sort of resolution and actually to order um, order that the funds be moved out of contingency and reserves is where they for, were. For so the AOC dues? Correct, yes. Yeah. So this is an addition to what would have been adopted. And so when the board directed um, for there to be an additional payment to AOC, then we had to move money out of reserves in order to make that additional payment. And this is the payment yeah. for the road fund issue Correct. at the AOC? Correct, oh, okay. yes, yeah. yes. This is separate from the annual dues that we typically pay AOC. It was a, a special assessment. Right, special mm -hmm. assessment, reconciliation for, before I, yeah. Okay, right. I apologize, it was before I came on. It didn't make sense, now it makes sense. Yeah. I'm not gonna hold up anybody anymore. Yeah. Now, and I'll just point out that there will be times that you will see agenda items come to you where there will be a comment that something will happen in the next supplemental. Um, there are times that we can make budget changes in a normal order resolution at a board meeting and there's times that we cannot. And sometimes for efficiency's sake, we just do all the budget, budget movement in one supplemental. So you will see things that you have approved, but the actual money movement will happen in a supplemental. Okay, are there other questions, uh, comments, before we take the vote on this motion? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those say no, the motion carries five to zero, all, pro all commissioners present and voting aye. Thank you so much, the resolution just adopted, and I really appreciate your uh, coming in, Ms. Um, Moody. Okay, um, next I'm gonna go to our, um, our, um, Employee recognition on our regular agenda, and that's uh, item six uh, on page two for anybody following at home. Um, and so I'll turn to Mr. Moker Heisky to uh, kind of announce this employee recognition. Sure, Mr. Chair, and I'm ha I know we only have a few public comments, so it's at the board's discretion. If you'd like to do public comment, then employee introduction, and then employee recognition, we can do that, or we can take these up now. Uh, let's take the uh, public works recognition okay. so our good folks from public works can have a more pleasant day than watching the Board of Commissioners. Well, I think they wanted to hear, Orrin said they wanted to hear public comment, but yeah. uh, why don't, I'm going to invite uh, everyone come up here. No. Um, Orrin and, I'm just and looking Dan at the, uh, I'm just looking at it from a taxpayer standpoint. Yes. That yes. Got a nice crew of people and I'm sure they have we, some things to do out there. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks for your consideration of the staff time and uh, taking this out of order. So, uh, Orrin, do you want to kick off the video? We have a little video we're going to show and then we'll do some introductions um, and go from there. Sounds perfect. Uh, Chair Sorensen, Commissioners, um, I first want to say thanks for having uh, a kind of a moment to recognize the work of the, the road staff here at Lane County. Um, it may not have been said at previous board meetings, but House Bill 2017, which has become a pretty good funding mechanism for the road fund, uh, in our road reporting, Lane County came across with all the reporting counties as the best rated PCI system in the state of Oregon. I bring that up because these are the people that got us there. And they don't always get recognized for those things, but 
Before we went into the storm and recognized the work that all these individuals did, I wanted to point out that this commitment goes year round. Um, it's not just snow or any other condition, it's the daily work that these guys put in. But um, the men and women of Rhodes are here. Um, these are representatives of a much larger group, um, even though they look large here. Um, I brought, I think, two or three individuals from each of our zones, from vegetation, sign shop, bridge, and all of our maintenance areas to get recognized because each and every one of these groups, each and every one of these individuals put in long hours, worked in situations that would be deemed at best unsafe and were very responsive to almost every public issue that arose throughout this entire process. Um, I couldn't be more proud to work on a team that was able to do this, commits to it, shows that passion to serve um, at any cost to them and the commitment to their families. These guys and men and women both will step up and do any work that's requested during these types of events. Um, Ethan Hibbler, who's sitting in the front row here, um, has been working to document some of this event and was able to put together a short video that we'd like to show to the board. Um, and I can go to that at this point if Devin's around to hit play.
So as you know, this was a storm of historic proportions for our area, an extremely challenging event. And these men and women here at road maintenance really rose to this challenge. I'm always proud of the work they do, but an event like this really shows the spirit of public works. Um, you saw the, the figure on the hours there, 4,700 hours of work in that week. And that's because these guys kicked into high gear and you know, round the clock, 24 hour operations. The call center was hopping. I think Warren and Keith didn't sleep for about five days. <laughs> it was um, quite an event and I just, I'm incredibly, incredibly proud of them. Um, and the video really doesn't show it justice. I mean, the, what you saw there was kind of after the roads had been cleared and they're doing the vegetation removal. But imagine, I mean, I got to tag along for a few hours with Cody um, in the middle of the night trying to clear an, a narrow road on a steep hill with a huge plow um, in the middle of the night. You know, you can't even see where the road really is. Uh, these men and women are extremely skilled and um, proficient and you know did a fantastic job here for the community. It was fun to see in my first year as a public works director, see this group kick into high gear and really perform at this level, performing an outstanding service for the community to get things open. So thank you all. I just uh, want to introduce a few of the folks that are here, uh, for, if you could stand maybe uh, from zone one uh, in Eugene, Ethan Hibbler and Aaron Jorgensen. And so the board, that's great, thanks. Uh, zone two, uh, Cottage Grove, Jesse Kochel and Steve Baker. Uh, zone three, Dexter, Mike Slavin and Leroy resides. Zone four, Vanita, Joe Reed and Tony Stevens. Zone five, Florence, Justin Henry, and Jeff Stinger. Our vegetation crew, uh, from our vegetation crew, Marla Miller and Jared Hecker. Our bridge crew, Cody Russo and Gabriel Kelly. Our sign shop, Chris Lloyd and Todd Stroda. And our office staff, part of the dispatch team, Jen Paw. Deanna Macon, uh, Melanie O'Hara, and Jamie Strand. So these folks were able to join us today to represent um, some of the folks and all the, the teams that were involved in this great effort. And I wanna just share with the board a few stories um, here. Uh, Leroy resides, uh, we think is deserving of the humanitarian award uh, during his week to open roads uh, in the Fall Creek area, Leroy was involved in two really significant events that are just, I've shared some of these stories in the community and people are just blown away by this level of commitment, um, that went well outside of the normal responsibilities and typical operations. He helped to bring baby formula to a young couple that was stranded at Sky Camp with a newborn child. Uh, in the same area, Leroy took actions to check on residents that were reported to be stranded, one of which I believe had a disability, physical disability. Leroy hiked over a mile through snow and down trees. And I used to hear these stories growing up in the Midwest from my parents. You know, I, I, hiked, I hiked a mile to school in three feet of snow. Those stories, of course, are an exaggeration. Leroy literally hiked over a mile through snow and down trees to make contact with these individuals um, and then communicate with search and rescue so search and rescue could come and clear a path to allow those individuals uh, to get out uh, and then to provide uh, support for other groups and access to services. Uh, Mike Slavin and Dan Keller are two of our employees that led the charge in maintaining access for Oak Ridge residents. Both Mike and Dan live in Oak Ridge and uh, they were really critical in coordinating with ODOT and Oak Ridge um, officials in making sure that um, uh, that that people could get the access to the services that they needed. Um, because our staff and equipment could not access Oak Ridge, uh, but their home, but they both live uh, in the area they took charge to work uh, to open county roads in Oak Ridge uh, for this small city as it was literally cut off to the outside world. Um, and they also assisted ODOT in ultimately opening Highway 58. Uh, Jeff Smith coordinated an effort with Search and Rescue to get our crews to open the West Boundary Road uh, to locate a stranded camper at the 12-mile post. 
Jeff worked with Search and Rescue and our county EOC that was established to navigate the process and eventually facilitate crews with Bonneville Power uh, that worked through the night to make sure that Search and Rescue staff could reach this individual. Saw Team 6, which is, I think, the coolest name of a team. They upped the game for the name of Saw Team 6, a six-person crew from the bridge and special projects team worked tirelessly to open Big Fall Creek Road. This is one of the worst impacted areas uh, during the storm, and this crew is integral uh, as part of the work in getting uh, the road open uh, with the Dexter crew and the vegetation team. Uh, our dispatch team, I mentioned some of our office staff that, that made up the dispatch team was just a marvelous crew of phone handlers and jugglers of critical information. They worked, uh, Jennifer, we introduced some of them, Jennifer Paw, Son Sarah Bisbee, uh, uh, Dina Macon, uh, Melanie O'Hara, and Jamie Strand. All these individuals were at the front lines of working with residents to understand concerns and needs and then coordinate with our teams to provide response. Their professionalism and commitment um, were extraordinary. And um, all of these folks are representation of the true heroes in this event. And they oftentimes don't get recognition um, because they're out in the field doing the hard work. But you can, these are just a few stories that give you an idea of the incredible um, extent to which folks went above and beyond. I mean, nobody asked Leroy to go hike a mile in, in you know, deep snow to help. It was just, you know, these are examples of folks that um, called upon themselves and they knew that, that uh, they were needed in these instances to really serve the community. And so we talk about our core behaviors in Lane County, the things, the behaviors that make our employees unique, a passion to serve, a drive to connect, and a focus on solutions. And it's so, you know, we talk about those things, but they're happening every day from our employees, right? It's not that we came up with those things. Well, we think we want our employees to act in this way. We identified the things that we know that our employees do that we value the most and said, this is what we want to lift up. And so this is really exciting for all of us um, in the leadership of the organization to uh, have the opportunity to invite these folks into this room in a public forum and recognize them for walking the talk around these core behaviors and um, I, we have some uh, certificates that I'll hand out to the supervisors, but I just want to, on behalf of our whole organization, thank all of you for your uh, commitment and hard work throughout this event and the, and the great work you do every day for our community. Thank you very much. And uh, I'll just call on any commissioner that wants to be recognized for any further comments. Uh, commissioner Buck. Thank you all. I'm especially proud of all your work that you did, not just on a day-to-day -day basis, but also in the winter storm. Um, my district was hit particularly hard in this particular storm, and many of you are, are in that district or were working in that district. And wherever you were, um, it meant a great deal to the people who were living there. And sometimes you don't necessarily see the connection of the person in the house on the road, unless you're Leroy and you're, you're going a mile to somebody's house. Um, but I know that they appreciate it as well. I was uh, in a storm, um, in an ice storm a, a few years ago. You know, I was one of those people on the other end of the house where it was just me and my baby at the time, and there was no power, there was no nothing, ran out of baby um, food and couldn't sanitize her bottles. That's a big deal for people who are out there. Um, many people have medical conditions and you know, your hard work really makes a huge difference and I just can't express how proud I am of you. Thank you and as the other rural commissioner, uh, West Lane was hit pretty hard but not as bad as East Lane but it was still, you know, the folks out in Poodle Creek area, um, you got, you guys know from the Vanita shop how bad it was out there towards No Tie and Walton. Um, first, I want to make a quick note because Oren spoke with an acronym there that the public probably doesn't realize uh, what he was talking about when he mentioned that we have the best PCI uh, in the state. That's pavement condition index. 
So, you know, these are the folks that are responsible for the fact that we have some of the best surfaced roadways in the entire state. So on top of the fact that they worked 4,700 hours the first week of the storm, they managed to keep our road system at a level that, that and besides the point that we also have the most, most number of miles of any county in the state of roads, they keep those roads in the best condition in the state. So just incredible work that you guys do. And I think one of the things this points out is the fact that public works folks are first responders. Quite often, the, you know, everyone thinks first responders, they always think police and fire. Yeah, and that's, you know, and that's, that's the, the law enforcement and, and fire folks are you know, every, what everybody thinks. Those folks can't get there until you guys open the roads. <laughs> you, know, you guys are the, the first ones out there in some of the most dangerous conditions. I mean, the, the, the electric companies can't get to putting wires back up till they can get their truck down the road. And, and it's, they're usually you know, right in behind you guys several, you know, quite often. Um, and just the, the work you guys do in some incredibly tough conditions, quite often what people don't realize is your families home somewhere without power, you know, struggling with all the things everyone else is struggling with while you're out there helping other people get their power and access back. So I, I really appreciate the hard work you all put in during this event. And I personally got to, to see a lot of the, the debris on the sides of the road as I, I took a bike ride in this beautiful weather on Sunday out Sayuslaw River Road. And I was just amazed at just how many trees were just kind of pushed out of the way that you guys had managed to get that road back open. Some of them still full of power lines wrapped all around the branches as they were just sitting off the sides of the road and the number of trees down was just incredible. You guys did an awesome job getting those roads back open to those two or three houses way out there between, you know, Fire uh, Road and, and Wolf Creek Road. You know, that, that kind of work just to get those houses accessible is pretty amazing. So kudos to all of you. Great job as first responders. Thank you. I'll, I'll be very brief. There's so much to say I, I could spend all day talking about it. You know, I spent a little bit of time this summer working on PCI with your asphalt crews. And, uh, and really, the work you do on summer days and the work you do on, uh, in superstorms, uh, same people doing the same work. Uh, it brings to mind an old quote that says, uh, who, it tells us who heroes are. Heroes are ordinary people who behave in an extraordinary fa fashion when called upon to do so, which is what you did. Um, I wanted to point out to um, Ethan a great video. It gives it all an insight as to the work that uh, the folks in the room here with you did, actually seeing it firsthand uh, and reading about it are two very, very different things. Um, but 4,700 hours the first week, that is a pretty remarkable number, and 800 reported downed trees. That doesn't say how many trees were actually down. That's just a reported number. It's pretty amazing that, um, that uh, Leroy took the time and had that heroism inside to, to wade through what had to be more than the 18 inches I had in my front yard to get to uh, the folks who needed help that day, that moment, and that, at that time. So thank you for all of that. Uh, it goes into a, a great big thank you that I cannot express all of the words. I do have a picture in mind that uh, it's uh, Kevin Dupay and Josh uh, Binder um, who were fixing the Oak Ridge generator that failed. Um, uh, it's just one picture that I actually have that uh, tells me that you don't only clear roads, you do what it is, what's necessary to get the service to the people who need it at that point in time. So thank you very much. Uh, once again, I could go on for a long, long time saying thank you. Del delivering baby formula, my gosh, that is, uh, that is the root of uh, uh, saving people at the time they need to be saved. Thank you. Have you noticed everyone has to get a turn in? <laughs> I'm learning how this works. <clears throat> I also noticed this was the first time commissioners allowed clapping in this room. So just to let you know, every time someone starts clapping, everyone goes, no, you can't clap in here. But apparently, we're waiving the rules for you guys, and appropriately so. Um, I just want to say this. I want to say, um, you know, two months on this end of, of this thing, um, Hey, I just wish I was uh, 
healthy enough to be out there on the roads doing the stuff you do, but I no longer am. I used to love it. Um, two, good job. Well done. And I say this tongue in cheek, and I have to do that so I don't get in trouble, but this might be a good way, good time to negotiate, you know, the next con. <laughs> it seems like you've generated an awful lot of goodwill. So thank you very much from the bottom of my heart, and it's been a pleasure working with you guys thus far. And I'll just say, uh, you know, ditto to everything that's been set up here. Uh, the thing that really uh, amazes me is that in a time when we are, you know, getting phone calls about my power is out, there's somebody out there already trying to clear the road so the people that are going to restore the power can get there. And I think that the idea of, of our public works crews uh, as being first responders is really spot on that, that uh, people don't always think about, well, how are we going to get this equipment in to help people? Well, the answer is we're going to send people out there who are going to put their own uh, life on the line and, and leave their families while they help lots of other people. So I, I just really appreciate it. And uh, thanks so much for uh, coming today and making this employee recognition. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And um, while you guys are going back to your work, uh, we will call up our, our uh, public um, comments. And I'd like a show of hands out there in the audience of people that have signed up for public comment. One, two, three, okay. And the sign-up sheet is coming. So if, uh, if you could just all move up toward the front of the room, be ready to go with your three minutes of public comment. That would be great. First person that signed up is James Houston. Uh, Mr. Houston, please come forward. And welcome to the Lane County Board of Commissioners. You and the other people that have signed up for public comment will receive uh, three minutes to address the board. Um, and that timing begins after you give your <coughs> name and after you give your um, where you live. Welcome. My name is James Houston. I live in North Eugene, specifically in the Falconwood Village retirement community that's been in the press a lot lately. Welcome. Thank you. I would like to address the affordable housing crisis and associated burgeoning homeless population in our community. Specifically, I'm here to speak on behalf of the disadvantaged in a highly competitive rental market. That would be senior citizens, the disabled, and those families living in or near the poverty line, such as single parents. The work currently underway regarding the lack of affordability and availability by the Eugene City Council's Renters Protection Task Force indicates that 51% of people living in our county do so in rental units, and it's only growing. This suggests that the majority of our citizens are now living in a landlord-tenant relationship. Senate Bill 608 that was recently passed by the, le the state, legislat state, legislat state legislation is the nation's first to allow for rent control measures statewide. It was a good first step, but it is a long ways from being adequate, perfect, or equitable. The law may well have hurt from more than help renters who wrestle with living in the lower socioeconomic groups. A 10% annual increase and rent is oppressive for those on fixed incomes and would surely be a contributing variable in our growing homeless population that this esteemed body keeps searching for answers and solutions to. Just in the past month, I've witnessed folks in Falconwood Village receive uh, rent notices where customarily it was four to five percent. Now uh, this predatory corporation that's been gobbling up uh, manufacturing home communities in Oregon nationwide, they're hitting them with the 10%. In fact, really it's 10.5%. This is uh, oppressive for people on fixed incomes, primarily elderly widows, which the park is pretty much populated by. Uh, it devastates them. Uh, basically you find elderly folks now having to decide whether or not they want to take their medication, give it up, not pay for it so they can pay for their increased rent and have a home to live in. Because as you may or may not know, most people that are still trying to be independent livers that are independent living that are uh, elderly, they don't want to go into an assistive care facility or live with their children. 
Just recently, I watched a woman receive a rent notice that went from 949 to 1049 starting next month. She doesn't know what to do. Senate Bill 608 was a good first beginning, but it goes a long way. I spoke with a prominent attorney here in town who's very versed in legal aid and dealing with elder law. Uh, we were looking at Senate Bill 608, and it does not indicate that there's any restrictions whatsoever on rent control in cities and counties. Thank you very much for your public comment. Oh, that's it. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's okay. So our next uh, person up is uh, Rob Handy. Welcome, Mr. Handy. Please come forward, give your name and where you live. And after you do that, I'll be giving you uh, three minutes uh, for your public comment. Welcome. Good morning, commissioners and Rob Handy, and you know where I live. So um, I'm talking about the Homes for Good board meetings briefly this morning. At the beginning of the year, the public was given a schedule of each of the board meetings throughout the year. And for the March meeting, it was posted as March 20th. And now it's on March 27th. And as you know, the uh, storm that we're, everybody's talking about forced the postponement of the February meeting. So given that the rescheduling to the March 27th date may mean that vital issues with potentially tremendous repercussions for all may be missed by some commissioners. The request is if all Lane County commissioners can't physically attend the 327 Homes for Good board meeting, cancel or reschedule that meeting, please. And if you won't do that, then adjust the agenda postpone two executive sessions. There's one about real property transaction and the other is the performance review of the chief executive officer. Also, any related items to the Lombard site should also not be on that agenda. Several of the commissioners here have expertise and have mentioned that priorities for affordable housing issues are important to them. It's rational and reasonable to postpone that March 27th board meeting until all board members can be physically <coughs> present. Recently, several folks met with Terry McDonald and last week and the Oregon Housing and Community Services rates the Lombard site as a preferred site for affordable housing, which supports what the community has supported for that site for decades. The Lombard site has not been on the tax rolls because of the decades long designation of this site as an affordable housing site. And okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much for your public comments this morning. Okay, our next um, person up is Dave Piccioni. Uh, you signed up for public comment on the Board of Health meeting, but I'm gonna assume you meant coming here at the Board of Commissioners meeting, is that correct? What did you say that I signed you up for? You signed up for the Board of Health Yeah, that's meeting. correct, that's what I signed up for. Okay, so we're not in the Board of Health, so. Well, I mean, this is something that doesn't have okay. anything to do then, with the Board of Health. Give, give your name and where you live, and okay. I'll give you three My minutes. My name's Dave Ivan Piccioni. If you put blog after that, you can read all my letters, which I stopped writing anymore. I was a little bit unhappy watching how there were so many of these fellows here. From my understanding, they were interested in hearing the, the going-ons of the public testimony. And the fact that they were told to go back to work because that's what they're getting paid for, that, that's kind of like the impression that I got, Pete, maybe it's not, not accurate. But uh, I think we need to be uh, helping people introduce themselves into our democracy, not trying to get them moving along. So uh, so can I, can I talk about the pod thing now? Sure, go ahead. Okay, uh, I, I have experienced uh, two close people that uh, were, that I one that I know for over 20 years and somebody that I worked with at the Department of Public Works in New Jersey. Uh, both these guys uh, wanted marijuana 
One of them was in New Jersey and the other one, it, they were, they're both in New Jersey. They couldn't, they, one of them would go into Washington Heights to try to buy a pot. And there was, nobody was s selling any pot. They were selling crack because that's where the money is. And this guy, uh, he, he didn't really want the crack, but he couldn't find the pot. And so he, 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 he would smoke crack instead sometimes and drink alcohol, which he also didn't like doing. The other guy is a closer friend of mine. He's known my, my drug history for many years uh, with heroin. Same thing happened to him. He went downtown in Somerset, New Jersey to buy a pot. Couldn't find any pot. The drug dealers are kicking out anybody who's trying to sell pot because the money is in heroin. My friend started using heroin. Disastrous consequences. Uh, and on the personal level, I don't smoke pot, but I, I, have, I have smoked it in the past and have had very good experiences and awful experiences. So... Uh, I, uh, I, I think I, I am happy that it's legal, and I, and I think that the other substances which people can use as medicine or as recreation should be legal as well, because that should be left up to the individual to figure out. Uh, so thank you very much for letting me speak. Thank you. Okay, and uh, let's see, make sure that we have uh, our... Uh, Next person up, uh, Eric Jackson. Mr. Jackson, uh, welcome to the Board of Commissioners meeting. I'm going to uh, give you three minutes for public comment after you give your name and uh, where you live. Eric Jackson, Eugene resident. Um, commissioner, gentlemen, city administrator. I, I almost want to start off on Mr. Pertoni's page and say, I smoke pot and I have only had good experiences. Never bad ones, but that's not really what I'm here for. But I just feel like I should have, so I did. <laughs> Somehow, the law doesn't apply to homeless people's property here in Lane County. I'm not quite understanding how that is because a steel container with nothing in it except all the property of the people at 99 that are still stuck out there on 99 at the St. Vincent's property because they have no place to store what was stored in storage on the county property. I got arrested by Eugene police last Saturday for charges that weren't filed. Friday night, I went to storage and everything was there. I picked up some things and the Eugene police threw them away summarily because they were wet when they arrested us. So as far as Eugene City is concerned, the Ninth Circuit Court decision that homeless people's property is property just as well as everybody else's and that you, the city, the county, and the state, you as government, have an obligation as the proprietor of the property and the proprietor of the lands in which they live. Therefore, you're the landlord. 90 days is Levon. I begged, begged you guys repeatedly and begged everybody at Public Works not to throw these people's property away because they had documents and things in them that they couldn't have at the 99 St. Vincent's camp, like father's ashes, like big bags of blankets, because they don't want them there. And you violated Levon versus LA, Ninth Circuit Court decision, hold on to property, 90 days, not 30 days plus, oh, we gave you 10 more extra days. No, you didn't because the law is 90. So say 30 all you want, send a piece of paper out that says 30 and it's getting thrown away on the 7th. Have people call and go there and not be able to get in prior to me getting in on Friday 
Sorry. Thanks very much for your public comment. You can't do what you did and Thank you very terrible much for thing. The public comment. Is there anyone else who has not signed up for public comment this morning who wishes to do so? Um, okay. So next, um, I think we're ready to, uh, uh, oh, do commissioners want to do their remonstrances now or do they want to uh, do them later? Now? Okay, let's have a two-minute round of public remonstrances. Commissioner um, Farr. Far, then Commissioner <laughs> Buck, then Commissioner Bernie, then Commissioner Bozovich, and then me. Two minutes each. Go for it. Thank you. I'm, I'm not going to respond to everything that was stated this morning. Just the, the last discussion that, um, that Mr. Jackson brought forward, and that's regarding uh, pro uh, property owned by people who don't have a place to live or don't have a place to store their stuff. It is essential that we find a way to get property back to people in a, in a, uh, in a way that is uh, uh, as swift as possible. Sometimes decisions are made uh, that if something is wet and beginning to mold, they throw it away, particularly when it's clothing, bedding, whatever it may be. Well, we need to be able to address that, Mr. Mokrajsk, in, in some fashion that allows the, the clothing or whatever it may be to get back to the people because sometimes that's all they own. Sometimes uh, it may be what keeps them dry tomorrow night. Um, we don't have a means to do that right now. However, at some point in the not too distant future, I'm going to be talking about laundry services that takes salvaged uh, clothing, bedding, etc., cetera, uh, cleans it, cleanses it, and, and uh, either returns it to the original owner or redistributes it to new ownership um, in ways that we don't just throw it in the landfill. A lot of this stuff ends up in the landfill. Um, so uh, so I, I just to get a bit of an alert right now is it's something that we do need to talk about. I have a few meetings scheduled in the next couple of weeks to talk about how do we... Uh, uh, cooperate to uh, have a laundry service, not like the one that St. Vincent de Paul has at the uh, the Lindholm Center, but one that is separate to that, that redistributes uh, clothing, bedding, et cetera, to people who need it the most. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Buck. <clears throat> I wanted to reiter reiterate um, our first comment, uh, first speaker that was talking about uh, advocating for low-income housing. We we know that that's an issue, it's on our plate. I look forward to implementing the TAC report and um, different findings there. Um, I also just wanna remind people, this is, um, I've had multiple references in the past week to commissioners as sirs or gentlemen. There is a woman now on the board and I know that's different, um, but this doesn't happen to my male colleagues. I just wanna remind people that that's noticed and would really prefer gender neutral, gender neutral pronouns. Um, and when it comes up, I will probably bring it up just so people notice it happens on a regular basis and it's something that we need to work on. Thank you, Commissioner Bernie. You're welcome, Commissioner Sorensen. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I don't have all the details, but um, I find it hard to imagine that in addition to what, it, what Commissioner Farr is going to bring forward, that we wouldn't have the ability to set up some sort of dry storage lockers for people um, for their stuff. I, I, I just can't imagine that. So I'm hoping that, when, that we'll hear more about providing that. Got it. Um, that's really all I have to say right now. Um, you know, I don't know about other commissioners, and I don't know um, how information, if information leaked, but I've been asked to um, pitch uh, and, and talk with the, uh, one of the media editorial boards, and that's what's caused, for me at least, a conflict with the Homes for Good. I know that our body is not the Homes for Good body. We're part of it. But I, um, at this time, I'm not making that meeting. But if I'm the only one, maybe we could change whether where I am and what that priority is. I'm just trying to respond to multiple priorities right now. That's all. Thank you very much, everyone, for, for speaking. Okay, Commissioner um, Bozovich. I'll pass on a remonstrance so we can move okay. the meeting along. Thank you. Uh, I'll just take a minute to say that um, regarding the problems of, uh, at, at um, 
mobile home parks that we used to have an office at Lane County, a, a consumer protection office, and uh, that went away due, due to uh, budget problems. And to me, uh, these issues of, of maybe honing in on landlord tenant as opposed to you know overall consumer issues uh, could be maybe addressed. But at this point, we haven't had the leadership either at the Board of Commissioners or from staff to to come up with a way to properly have a role in this process. And I think that we, like I said, we used to have a consumer protection office uh, lodged in the DA's office to um, try to deal with people who had been um, swindled or people that had been uh, maybe the victims of, of, of uh, landlord tenant uh, kind of uh, landlord abuse uh, or alleged landlord abuse, and we don't have that. So it'd be something for the board to consider or staff to consider in terms of uh, making sure that we do play a proper role in protecting people. I think we did that quite effectively with our uh, veteran service office, uh, again, Torrent with the goal of protecting people, um, might consider that in the area of, of elder abuse where we have thousands of people um, who um, maybe potentially are victimized by consumer ripoffs of one sort or another. And on this uh, topic of, uh, of whether the county has distinct from other um, you know, jurisdictions, um, throws away the uh, property of people who have been um, arrested or detained or something. I guess uh, at some point in the meeting, maybe we can ask the administrator for a report on that and see if that's something that the county does uh, or what our policy is and whether it complies with the, uh, with the Ninth Circuit rulings that Mr. Jackson um, brought to our attention. And... Um, um, I, I express concern, on, and this is my last topic, I express concern about scheduling the meeting of the Homes for Good during a down week, uh, which we typically do not schedule meetings, but that is a decision of Homes for Good, uh, and at this point, their meetings published, their meeting announcements published. Um, so I don't know who's attending or who isn't attending, but um, that's my understanding of that. Okay. So thank you for all of your remonstrances. And uh, next, I think we'll... Mr. Chair. Yeah, yeah to, uh, let's have another round no, of comments. because We do it, have a consumer protection website at Lane County, so... Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, sir. Okay, um, I'm gonna try to um, keep us moving here. So at this time, I'm gonna call up uh, uh, the item on the work session. That'll be item, um, that's the joint meeting of the Board of Health and Commissioners meeting. Uh, do you want to do the employee recognition introduction first? Okay. Then uh, let's go to item uh, five on the bottom Mayor, page one. Yes, sir. Would it be appropriate for you to, um, to call us into order as the Board of Health? Yes, that would be good. Uh, you, all you right. At, so at, at this time, time, we're going we're gonna to convene our, uh, our joint meeting of the Board of Health with the Board of Commissioners meeting. And uh, item 5A is um, uh, our employee introduction. And uh, thank you so much for Karen for being here to introduce our uh, employee who's being introduced. So welcome to both of you. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I uh, just make a couple of brief comments. I asked Karen to introduce Pauline. Um, our new, who's a Hawkeye, by the way. Yes, yay. <laughs> She's a Hawkeye. I'm a Badger. <laughs> so we'll get over that, we're a Big Ten rivalry. Um, we're really pleased to welcome Pauline to our organization. Karen will talk more about her background experience and the process we went through to uh, bring Pauline to our team. Karen, by the way, who has been our Health and Human Services Director for a little over a year, has assembled a phenomenal team uh, in Health and Human Services and just continues to um, add quality and talent to uh, to that group. I yesterday had an opportunity to engage with Karen and her management team, including Pauline, uh, and uh, got a really good feeling for uh, Pauline's good-natured humor. She was asked to go first or second 
uh, of like 10 division managers, even though she's been on the job for only a few weeks. It was alphabetical. And she handled it wonderfully. And um, so anyways, I'll pass it off to Karen, but we're really um, thankful that you've joined us and uh, looking forward to, to your great leadership and working with you. Thank you, Chair Sorensen and Commissioners. Um, it is truly a pleasure to be able to introduce the newest member of the leadership team at Health and Human Services. Um, by, by way of introduction to the job, before I tell you a little bit more about Pauline, I would remind you that our behavioral health program is critical in so many different um, strategic areas that the count, where the county is focused. I was really struck this morning watching the video of the road crew and listening to public comment about all of the beauty that is Lane County and all of the challenges that we're called upon to address in this work. Uh, so in terms of our work at Behavioral Health, we um, provide a medication-assisted treatment program, methadone and suboxone, um, to people with heroin and other opiate addictions in the community. We also run a large um, outpatient uh, clinic over at 2411 uh, uh, Martin Luther King Boulevard, uh, where we provide um, clinical services to children and adults with uh, mostly with serious and persistent mental illnesses. Um, in addition to that, uh, many of you know we've grown recently uh, the team at Lane County Behavioral Health that's focused on forensics issues. So that's our intersection with the public safety system. Um, how do we address um, the very big pressing issue in our jails of overrepresentation of people with mental illness. Um, how do we work with the state hospital to bring people um, out of the state hospital and um, and give people treatment and a life in the community. So that's the, the stage um, and the setting into which we've recruited Pauline to, to do this work. Pauline is a licensed clinical social worker and um, I'm quite pleased to say we have stolen her from the State Hospital in Junction City, um, where she really has done some tremendous work as the Associate Director of Social Work there to transform mental health service delivery um, with a particular emphasis on deinstitutionalization and, and person-directed recovery services. So that's a huge piece for us and our work. Um, but before that, she includes 15 years of managerial experience in the mental health field. Um, in addition to working in the hospital, she's worked in shelters, residential settings, day treatment, various other community settings. So um, Pauline brings that wide lens of our behavioral health system in, in terms of our work for moving um, our behavioral health to the next level. So I could not be more pleased um, to introduce Pauline to you. I think those same uh, core behaviors that we talked about earlier in terms of public works that um, driven to connect, passion to serve, and solution focused, uh, that is absolutely what we look for as we're recruiting leaders into this organization. And in the short, maybe five weeks that Pauline has been here, um, she absolutely is demonstrating all of those as she settles into her work with our behavioral health team and really moves into that fast moving current um, in our river of behavioral health. Uh, issues and systems in our community. Um, so I'm excited to, to introduce Pauline to you um, and invite you all to uh, um, have an opportunity to come out to Behavioral Health and, and get to know her a little bit better. And certainly as we enter into our budget process, I know you'll have that opportunity as well. So I don't know if you wanted to add anything before we turn um, I don't know that there's anything I want to add. I think uh, Karen captured it all. But I'm uh, excited to be a part of the county. I think this is the biggest job I've had so far. I've been in various settings, and this is kind of, in terms of scope, this is the largest that I've had so far. So I'm um, looking forward to the challenge and um, hoping to work with you all, and I appreciate the opportunity this morning to meet all of you. I've only seen you on TV, so this is great. <laughs> Okay, uh, do commissioners want to make some uh, welcoming remarks? May I? Yeah, sure. Welcome. <laughs> um, I want you to know, I want the commissioners to be aware that you said that this is your largest job so far, so we need to keep her as long as we can, because obviously she's going bigger and better places. 
And this is the most excited I've ever seen Ms. Gaffney. I just want you to know that. So she must really be very, very proud of this hire. <laughs> That's all. Nice to meet you. Uh, welcome, Pauline. And uh, you are jumping into a pretty big uh, department. And our previous performance auditor actually identified this department as one of our highest risk departments for the county. So it, it's not only, you know, got a broad spectrum of services we provide, but it also exposes the county to great risk at times. So it's a tough job to fill, and, and coming from the state hospital, you probably are pretty aware of some of the, the folks we have to deal with and the spectrum we deal with. Um, I'm glad to have a new constituent um, working, you know, that it's actually a constituent and an employee, uh, as, as Ms. Martin lives in Junction City. Um, which I spend a, a fair amount of time. In fact, I was up at the Daffodil Festival this last weekend um, <laughs> and rode right through Junction City on the way on my bicycle. Um, so, you know, it's really, uh, there's a lot of places we intersect and I also happen to be the board's representative to the Public Safety Coordinating Council and we're looking, looking at our next biennium budget right now. And there's, you know, you guys came up yesterday in our first budget meeting uh, and at, at, about um, doing some uh, treatment and whether or not that's going to be more sponsors responsibility now because they're being allowed to bill Medicaid and that that whole uh, intersection of Medicaid billing and mental health treatment and then ha what happens with incarcerated people coming in and out, on and off of Medicaid um, is a place that I have a lot of interest in and we'll, we'll probably have a lot of conversations in the future because that's really so harmful to some of these folks that come into our criminal justice system and then lose their benefits. And we have to try and restart them through the jail's health system. And then when they come out, there's this delay in restarting their benefits. And, and that just is not, you know, when you're dealing with people with, with you know, severe mental health issues, you don't want to have them stop, start, stop, start. You, you want constant treatment, and uh, we have to find some way of fixing that and bridging those those gaps. So I really look forward to, to working with you on that, particularly seeing we have such a high rate of folks with mental health issues in our jail, in our criminal justice system here in Lane County. So look forward to working with you. Thank you, Commissioner Farr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it's, it's good to see you, Pauline, and I'm going to point out that uh, you're not new to Lane County. Uh, having not only lived here, you've been a regular attendee at our monthly mental health summit, um, participating and being a part of that. So you know how committed Lane County is to your work and to supporting you in your work. It's been demonstrated to you because you have actually been a part of it. I had a chance to talk to you a couple of Thursdays ago, and it's, it's just delightful to hear your perspective on how we can coordinate all of our services between public safety, between the judicial system, uh, between the jails and, and diversion from jails, the things that we are all so excited about and that you have been already a part of. And this coming Thursday, I see uh, um, Elizabeth Maxwell is in the audience. We'll be at the Mental Health Advisory Committee meeting together on Thursday afternoon. Look forward to seeing you again there. I just have a general welcome, and you come with a great deal of experience, so I'm excited to have you. Um, well, as far as the television thing, we're actually much taller than <laughs> you currently see us, because we have these chairs that lower or raise us down. So I, I just want you to know I'm, I'm really much taller than I currently appear, so I just want to point that out. And, and you the first thing too. on everyone's mind. That's yeah, yeah. the first thing on everyone's <laughs> mind. Okay, and the second thing I want to say is is it is correct that that your work and the and the behavioral health um, arena does expose Lane County to a lot of financial risk and that is a given that's the way it is and so part of your job is to reduce that risk or at least be aware of that risk but I just want to say that in my view people are people and people deserve a dignity and they deserve to be treated with dignity and I'm sure that with your vast experience that's been a hallmark for you already or you probably wouldn't have been hired by Ms. Gaffney for this important job and last but not least I, I feel that 
our society is making slow but steady progress towards the idea that people with behavioral health problems, just as people with physical health problems, really don't belong in our criminal justice system. That whatever we can do in a, in, whether as commissioners, as county administrator, department director, you, uh, all of fine folks that work in, in health and human services, um, our, our jail staff, I mean, on and on and on, the law enforcement function, and our related agencies, such as your former employer and, and, and the state in general and the court system, whatever we can do to try to get people into the appropriate um, you know, system and specifically away from criminal, the criminal justice system and into the health system, uh, I think that's really going to be an important thing. And I'm sure in, in your career, you've seen a marked change in society. I certainly have um, in my um, 47 plus years involved in public policy issues. So um, I, I just really am optimistic about your new job and um, and just keep in mind that we are people even though we appear on TV screens from time to time. Thank you and welcome, and we hope you have a, a good career with us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to call up uh, item uh, 6A now, so anybody involved with that, uh, please come forward. That's going to be our uh, work session on strategies related to marijuana prevention for youth. And with us is, again, Karen Gaffney. You can introduce the people that are with you and um, we'll um, enjoy this work session. Thank you. Um, Chair Sorensen, commissioners, while Jocelyn's pulling up the slides, I do um, have with me today Elizabeth Maxwell, who will be doing the bulk of our presentation. We've, um, and Jocelyn Warren, our uh, manager for public health. Um, and before I turn it over to, to Jocelyn, I just wanted to say our um, our goal today, we have this set up as a work session, so there's not a specific order in front of you. Um, we've tailored our remarks to um, leave plenty of time for discussion and interaction and really hoping for direction from the board in terms of next steps. Um, we've talked a lot at the county over time about um, land use issues related to marijuana. This is really our first opportunity to talk about public health issues that are related to marijuana as the laws have changed in the state. So I'm looking forward to the work session. I'll toss it to Jocelyn before we let Elizabeth do all the heavy lifting. <laughs> Chair Sorensen and commissioners, thank you for the opportunity to um, bring these strategies to you. This follows a previous presentation where we talked a lot about um, alcohol and other substance use, but this is our first opportunity to address strategies, which was a request of the board, um, potential policy strategies. So that's a really exciting position for us to be in. I think the last time we've really done that was around tobacco in a comprehensive way. So this is a sort of a new idea for us and a new field around uh, youth prevention and it's an beginning of the conversation so we're hoping to get some direction from you and maybe um, we can do some um, additional research and refining of the strategies as we move forward but this will give us a first sense of uh, where the board is interested in going in this issue. So I am delighted to introduce Elizabeth Maxwell. She's new to some of you, not all of you. Elizabeth is the lead on our alcohol and other drug prevention team. So she will be giving the presentation today and I'll be doing her slides. All right. <clears throat> Is this okay? Can you hear me? Um, so I just want to emphasize that uh, we are gearing this towards youth prevention. So um, we're not talking about any inroads. It's been legalized, and so we're keeping this to trying to protect youth. Uh, and so you'll see that theme throughout. Um, so we wanted to start off and talk about, uh, you know, there are some health benefits. Um, so research into the health risks and benefits of marijuana has been pretty limited, um, but is growing. And I think part of that is due to more legalization happening across the country in different states. Uh, so until recently, one drug using a synthesized version of a chemical in marijuana was approved by the FDA to treat nausea, vomiting, and weight loss, usually cancer or HIV. 
and that is called Marinol. Um, and then it was not until June of 2018 that the first drug derived directly from the marijuana plant was approved by the FDA. And this kind of hit the media um, in 2018. And so the drug is called Epidiolex, um, and it's a CBD derivative and helps with uh, usually young children who are experiencing uh, pretty rare forms of epilepsy. Uh, growing research with marijuana suggests the potential for additional drug approvals. So I think it's um, a moving target, which is what we're all seeing. And so we're going to see that things seem to change daily. Um, and so emerging research uh, will probably suggest new risks, harms, and benefits uh, that we're unaware of at this time. Um, and I would also say that um, just according to Oregon law, um, neither medical or retail dispensaries are allowed to make any health claims. And so, you know, sometimes we'll see signage at some of the dispensaries with health claims, and they're actually not supposed to do that, whether it's medical or retail. So some of the health risks for youth, and this all comes from the 2017 National Academy of Medicine report. Um, they, it's about 400 pages. If you're interested, I can email it to you. Um, you probably don't want to read it all, but um, <clears throat> I read most of it. Um, and so they kind of synthesized all of the research that has been done about marijuana, trying to figure out are there health benefits? What are the risks? Um, and so these are some of the things that they came up with <clears throat> is short-term memory and judgment impairment, perception distortion. And again, this is for youth. Um, and that regular use could have long-term negative effects on cognitive development. And I'm sure you've heard uh, prevention staff in here before. We really worry about developing brains. And so <clears throat> as you all probably know, the brain is not fully developed until mid-20s, you know, by 25. And so we worry about, um, you know, children who are using uh, chronically or, you know, any kind of uh, drugs or alcohol prior to that. Um, and contrary to popular belief, um, marijuana actually can be addictive. So I work a lot with the treatment providers in our community, and all of them have patients that they're currently treating either just for marijuana addiction or in combination, uh, you know, we're seeing more poly drug use as well. Uh, chronic bronchitis is also something that is seen in kind of your chronic long-term user. Um, and it is associated with mental health issues in certain people with a pre-existing genetic or other vulnerability. Um, and so there are some new studies coming out. Um, there was just a NIDA study uh, that came out uh, just this month, I believe. Um, and what it documented was early chronic use by males um, was associated with some pretty significant brain changes by the age of 22. So some research is coming out. Um, and so then uh, some of the public health concerns uh, that we have, this talk is all about prevention of underage use, uh, but also prevention of unwanted exposures and so trying to protect the public and workers. Obviously, prevention of impaired driving. Our law enforcement are starting to report uh, more times that when there's a toxicology test run, marijuana is implicated. Again, sometimes alone, sometimes with other drugs uh, in the system as well. And then uh, we'd like to take opportunities to educate pregnant women about the potential negative effects on fetal development. Um, that's a concern for us. And then just to keep in mind, there's no dose that has been established for marijuana, so we can't make any recommendations about a safe amount. So with alcohol, there's a safe amount. You know, we know what hard liquor is, what a serving is. We don't know that for marijuana, and so it makes it very complex and a little bit tricky. So youth perceptions, uh, many youth, and this comes from the Student Wellness Survey, um, which is done uh, every two years in Oregon, and this is county level. Uh, many youth report that marijuana is easy to obtain, um, and the perception of risks of marijuana has declined, and we've kind of seen that uh, since legalization. Uh, marijuana use is also linked to alcohol, cigarettes, and e-cigarettes, so if a child is using marijuana, they're also more likely to use those other things. So in Lane County, uh, we pretty regularly hear public concerns. These are anecdotal. I don't have a study to document this, but uh, we hear concerns about too many retailers. We hear concerns about the advertising that happens, which appears to be pretty ubiquitous uh, in our county. And a higher percentage <laughs> of youth in our county report seeing uh, marijuana advertising, and that's specific to our community, so that's as compared to the state. And then we also notice uh, targeting of U of O students, and so some of those dispensaries that are right around the university and kind of into the downtown area, they will have signs up specifically targeting U of O students. And so one thing to keep in mind, at most given times, about half of the population of U of O is underage. So they're 
targeting a population that has quite a few underage people in it. Um, sales appear, appear to be on the increase. We see that regularly in the media. And as of December, uh, there were 87 active marijuana licenses in Lane County. That doesn't mean that we have 87 stores. Um, some of them may have gone out of business, but they still have the license. Some of them are starting a business, but still have, you know, have the license. So that doesn't mean we have 87 stores, but it's around that. <laughs> So we just wanted to kind of put up some strategies for discussion, um, and some of these are things that other communities have done. Uh, so one thing that could be done is to prohibit marijuana lounges and the use of marijuana at special events. Uh, what we've seen in the last few legislative sessions for the state is things like this seem to keep getting proposed, and it's um, they violate the Indoor Clean Air Act, and so that's a concern for us in public health. So if they were prohibited, uh, it would reduce youth exposure, decrease the risk of impaired driving. When you've got a store or a place that people are going to, they might be driving, and so they might drive back as well. And then it's assumed that if you were opening a business, there has to be some worker there, and so the Indoor Clean Air Act is also supposed to um, uh, protect employee health and then the public. We also hear pretty regularly anecdotal concerns from the public about people already now being outside using marijuana and then having those unwanted exposures. So another thing uh, we could do, a strategy would be to enact a county ordinance to reduce marijuana retail density. Uh, this would reduce, reduce youth exposure and experimental use. Limit the perception of normalization. I think we're all seeing that, that it's definitely becoming more normalized in our community. Um, and some that has happened, so as all of you are aware, uh, the Eugene City Council did pass a resolution in May of 2018 that um, they did say that there had to be a thousand foot buffer. So it has been done, it's been done right here. Um, and so there's a good body of research showing that tobacco and alcohol density are correlated with increased use by youth. Um, and so unfortunately with marijuana, because we don't have all the research, we have to extrapolate from tobacco and alcohol research and uh, sort of apply it to the marijuana situation. Um, but there are some studies being done. Um, in 2015, uh, there was a study in the Drug and Alcohol Dependency Journal that showed that uh, dense marijuana retail, um, so a neighborhood that had dense marijuana retailers, um, also had an increase in the number of hospitalizations linked to marijuana in that um, area. So kind of interesting. Um, and next, uh, restrict retail marijuana advertising that is attractive to youth. And this is already outlined in state law, um, but we seem to be seeing that it's not always adhered to in our community. So alcohol and tobacco research suggests reducing exposure can delay youth use. And there's some evidence that marijuana advertising is linked to increased youth use. And more of our youth in Lane County report seeing marijuana advertising again than compared to the state. And again, we have to take tobacco and alcohol research and kind of extrapolate. Um, but there, are, there is some research being done um, in 2015. And the Psychology of Addictive Behaviors Journal, uh, they did a study that showed that greater marijuana advertising was associated with an increase in children having the intention to use marijuana, which that's something that we worry about, and then also having greater initiation to using marijuana. And that was um, 8,000 kids that were surveyed, sixth to eighth grade in California. So it's, it's a sizable number. Um, so that's a fairly interesting finding. And then we just wanted to show an example of, you know, the one on the left we would say is a little more responsible. Um, you can't quite see it from that picture, but it is opaque. Um, so walking by, you can't see any of the product. You can't see the names. You, unless, you know, most adults know what that green cross means, and I'm sure more youth than we would like to think know what that green cross means. But it's kind of a signal, you know, to just some people looking for that. And so if you didn't know what it was, you wouldn't really know what that store was. On the other side is a little less responsible. You've got the big neon signs, you've got all of their sales, the cheapness of it advertised up top. Um, and I've covered with blue boxes um, because these are actual retailers in our community. But on the other one on the window is another giant neon sign with the store's name. So. Things could be done uh, to make it a little more responsible. So uh, requiring packaging of edible marijuana be less attractive to children. So we have seen that poison control calls have steadily increased since legalization. Um, so they kind of peaked there in 2016. But if you look at the numbers for 2017 and 2018, they're still quite a bit higher than they were 
pre-legalization. And so that's a concern. We were not able to access county level data on this, so that is state, um, that's the state level data. And then I just provided a few examples, and these are from local retailer websites. So I didn't go any, these are all you know, from people who have businesses in our community. And so you can see the colors are pretty bright, you know, kind of attractive. A child who didn't know, wouldn't know that those aren't candy. The root bites uh, over there on the right, you know, they just look like gummies that kids eat. Um, and so there's some concerns uh, about the Girl Scout cookies though. <laughs> Just wait. Oh, okay. It's coming. Um, <laughs> next, uh, so prohibiting marijuana products in retail and online form from being named for products commonly associated with minors. Again, this is already in state law and being regularly violated. Um, so I've given you some examples, and again, these are local, so I did not pull these off of you know a store that is not here. So uh, in the state law, they specifically call out that you are not allowed to name things by Star Wars characters because commonly associated with kids, there's a whole set of cartoons. So you see Princess Leia, Wookiee, and Death Star. Um, so those are all Star Wars references. You also have Narnia, which is a set of children's books and movies, uh, Junior Mint, candy for kids, and there's your Girl Scout cookie. So uh, <laughs> Thin Mint, uh, eaten by kids and sold by kids. And then I think even more concerning, Cookie Monster is a Sesame Street character. So that is a preschool child reference. Um, and then Curious George just misspelled down there at the bottom. And I would also add that it's concerning when you think about normalization that some of these pictures are right next to the product itself. Um, so that is what marijuana looks like and it's right next to it. So that could be concerning. Uh, so also, uh, this is kind of taken from tobacco research, but prohibiting marijuana discounting, coupons, dollar off, uh, half off, things like that. Uh, tobacco research shows that this is the most effective way to reduce youth initiation by increasing price. Youth are pretty price sensitive, and so even though we're not saying that underage people are going into the dispensaries and purchasing, we, we don't, haven't seen that. Um, but if somebody else is purchasing for them, they're paying that price and then passing that price on to kids. And so if it's super cheap, then you haven't, it's accessible to kids. And so I just included a couple examples of coupons. Again, these were online. Um, the one over there on the right is kind of concerning. Um, it's um, aimed at skateboarders. And I'm sure there's a lot of people over the age of 21 who are skateboarders. I think there's probably more under the age of 21 who are skateboarders. Uh, and lastly, uh, supporting House Bill 2382, which I believe you have already done. Um, I think Alex Kyler um, brought that before you. So um, I think we didn't, Alex and I didn't communicate about that, I guess. Um, so I think you already know about it. And the only thing that we would add is if it comes to pass that we would ask that some of the revenue uh, be used to help our prevention efforts towards youth. And then you have a summary of all the strategies. Okay, so are you done with your presentation or would you like to make additional comments? I just uh, would like to summarize a few things as I turn it over to the board for your discussion. Um, and perhaps I should have done this initially is to acknowledge this is our first work session as a board of health um, with the new board. And as part of that, uh, I would uh, be remiss if I didn't call out at least one difference between the Board of Health and the Board of Commissioners and part of the reason you're convened as the Board of Health. Um, clearly, this is a, a public health issue, so it makes sense to convene you as the Board of Health to look at ways to um, protect the health of people who live in this community. It also is different when you sit as the Board of Health. Um, you have the responsibility and the authority to ensure um, health conditions for everyone who lives in Lane County. So um, that includes being able to adopt policy inside city limits um, as well as in unincorporated Lane County. So that's one piece that's different as you sit as the Board of Health. Um, as, as Jocelyn said in the beginning, we're, we're looking for direction, general direction today, and um, if there are some of these strategies that sound particularly promising, then that would give us the opportunity to do a deeper dive, bring you back more information, um, and 
we've certainly approached this topic similar to the way uh, a number of years ago as part of the Community Health Improvement Plan. Um, the board was interested in looking at how do we reduce youth tobacco use in Lane County, and there isn't any one single policy that's going to achieve that goal. It really is a constellation of strategies. Um, so I would, I guess, just set that expectation that this is the beginning of a longer conversation with the board um, that we look forward to um, bringing you that data and really linking this back up to the work that you've prioritized in your strategic plan under the goal of a healthy and safe community. You've talked about um, prevention efforts and community health and particularly around um, youth prevention and this falls squarely in that strategic priority for the board. So I'll turn it back to you, Chair Sorensen. Okay, thank you. And uh, I think we'll take a round of comments Comments from the commissioners, and I'll start first. Uh, I'm in favor of pursuing all those options, uh, and just uh, by way of our, um, you know, uh, uh, work session, I think all those things uh, look good to me. Uh, we're talking not about regulation of marijuana. We're talking about regulation of marijuana as it applies to uh, people under age, and uh, so I think we need to do that. My Big questions are, are twofold. One is um, you mentioned hospitalization uh, increasing because of kids or youth that have, you know, ingested marijuana and they've been, and, and so I wanted to ask you, what do you mean by that? What are they hospitalized for? So I think what you're referring to is just a study that I referred to. So that was not in our community. And so it was a study, and I, I apologize, I don't remember where it took place. But what it looked at was a very dense neighborhood with marijuana retailers and then compared it to other neighborhoods that were less dense and saw that hospitalizations for marijuana related, and that wasn't just for youth, that was for all people. Um, it had an increased hospitalization rate. So we can't necessarily apply that to our community and we haven't seen that locally, um, but it's something that has been okay. seen elsewhere. And then uh, my big issue is how do we get the enforcement? I mean, uh, do we get a local, if we, if we can't get the state legislation passed, do we have the authority to have local uh, enforcement or local taxes or local fees or fines or, uh, something that would allow us to and have the enforcement what what's what's our flexibility currently my understanding is yeah we don't have the authority of course to enforce state law but if we adopted that into our own code we would then have the authority to do but, that but where would the money come from to, for the enforcement i think it would have to come from fees or fines or some other source that you what identified. suggestions do you have for fees that could be um, um, imposed on uh, retailers uh, for the Board of Health uh, Authority so that we're covering all 87 uh, licensees. So I can um, tell you a few things about what, what other communities have done and we'd have to decide if that was feasible for here. But some communities have actually uh, put taxes on products that seem more attractive to children and so they put a higher tax on edibles on beverages uh, that are infused with marijuana. Um, and so that's one way of getting a little more um, taxes. And then other I would call that uh, strategy eight. Okay. Yeah, okay. <laughs> So that's one. Um, and then there are, we'd have to explore it a little more, but um, there are some communities that have created a tax structure where they've tried to tax the product at every point. So tax it at the grower, at the manufacturer, at the retailer, and that can also, um, and California seems to be at the head of doing things like that. So yeah. we can definitely get creative and I'd be happy to explore further avenues if you okay. want to do that. Very good. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, three minutes and 16 seconds. Who would like to take at least that much time? <laughs> Commissioner Farr. Thank you, I will not take that much time, I don't believe. You know, Elizabeth, as I look at the strategies, it really reflects uh, very closely the strategies we employ toward tobacco use. Many of the same principles, many of the same, you know, increase a price so that youth have less access because youth are, as you said, uh, price conscious. <laughs> uh, so um, that's uh, Commissioner Sorensen's strategy eight, which is also probably a part of strategy six, um, the coupons off, et cetera. So um, I'm, I'm in favor of everything that we did about tobacco, including Dr. Ludke. I still have the, 
the uh, Girl Scout cookies jar that you gave to me. So uh, a box of Girl Scout cookies in a little jar that one kid could just consume very, very quickly. It's vaping tonic. So um, I, I am in, in favor of everything that we are that you're looking at here. It really is very closely uh, reminiscent of the things that we've did regarding uh, regarding tobacco. Um, I expect to be closely attuned to recommendations from you as far as what we can do in either individually or as a board of commissioners to make certain that we restrict youth access. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is uh, something that you said, um, Ms. Maxwell Elizabeth, uh, earlier in the meeting that the legislature continually throws curveballs at us. Uh, one of the, such curveballs may be uh, House Bill 2233 which ostensibly says that it gives the uh, uh, OLCC control over uh, special events and marijuana lounges. But at the same time, it does specifically say that uh, marijuana use is permitted in designated areas that are governed under that subsection. So 2233 seems to me one of those curveballs that we have to be able to respond to by, first off, um, either changing the language or making certain that we get our point across that we don't want the uh, uh, access in special events, for instance, which uh, while the OLCC is absolutely remarkably flawless at controlling things, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, that's, that was, <laughs> Commissioner Bernie, that was talking cheek. <laughs> um, the, <laughs> the, you know, we, we cannot expect them to be able to control youth access during special events, whether it's a Led Zeppelin concert or whether it's a, a, a festival at uh, one, of our, one of our parks. Um, so, keeping an eye on the legislature, making certain that it does, is attuned to the strategies that we implement as a board subsequent to this meeting. And Ms. Gaffney, a very important thing that you, you kind of almost whispered, uh, you buried your headline, as the Board of Health, we govern everything inside and outside UGBs in, uh, and city limits in Lane County. So we can pass ordinances that apply inside the city of Eugene, inside the city of Veneta, and every place else uniformly. And uniformity is absolutely the essential element here, whether it be uh, how you advertise your product, um, how you display on your storefronts, how you, the openings of your windows, making sure that everybody does it the same so that there isn't one, one entity getting a leg up over the others or one uh, loophole that people can, can step through. So good work. A lot of work to be done, like there was with tobacco. Um, and a lot of this is possibly less popular than our work on tobacco. Yes, I would agree with that. Uh, we had uh, we had testimony earlier that I've smoked pot all the time and I found it pleasurable. I paraphrase that. Sure. I have the exact quote written down here, but uh, you know it's uh, it's an uphill battle. But let's let's fight the battle. Thank you. I believe that uh, Benton County has actually been preemptive, and they have enacted an ordinance um, saying that there won't be any lounges or special events where marijuana would be allowed. So I think that is something, and we could look more into that more for you. But I believe that you can do that. Thank you. Okay, any other commissioners wish to be recognized on this round? Commissioner Buck. Just quickly, I am actually quite shocked at what the packaging is for children. You know, as a mom of a five-year-old, that's incredibly scary to know that she could be thinking she's in the candy aisle, but not. <laughs> um, so, you know, I'm supportive of making sure that we <clears throat> restrict that kind of access uh, for children um, and that kind of advertising. I um, absolutely recognize it's a valid industry for adults, but when it comes to our children, we, um, we have to be diligent. Okay, Commissioner Bozovich. Thank you. Um, and as Karen knows, you know, I'm a libertarian at heart, so I'm not anti-marijuana for adults that can make an informed decision to consent to utilize it. But when it comes to kids, like tobacco, I'm really tough. Um, so I, I support the strategies up there. But you know, some of my concerns are is our ability to make this really be countywide. Uh, you know, how many of those re 87 retailers are actually in unincorporated Lane County? I think it might be three, but I'm not, I'm not positive. I know of one in Mapleton, I know one south of Florence, and I don't think, I'm, I'm trying to think of where the others are. There might be one outside of Veneta that, that's out, outside of the, 
a city limit. So really when you talk about the retailers that we want a lot of these strategies to apply to, they're inside city limits. We had this issue come up in our tobacco retail licensing is does it does it apply inside city limits? Where does where does our ability as a board of health to regulate overlap with city home rule? And can't you know if we pass something that says you can't have this kind of advertising at a at a marijuana retail outlet, will it apply inside city limits? Chair Sorensen and um, Commissioner Bozovich, we did do that research with County Council um, when we were looking at tobacco, and it is the board's option as a board of health. You may impose things countywide within city limits. We did that with the Tobacco 21 ordinance um, and with the e-cigarette um, policy. So that is an option for the board of health, but we would absolutely have you take that option, take that action as the board of health and not the board of commissioners. Yeah. The retail licensing, though, we chose not to go right. inside city limits because cities already license tobacco retailers, and therefore we really couldn't control advertising and product placement or anything inside cities. I think that's where this is, you know, and a lot of cities already tax marijuana, and it's a significant revenue stream for particularly the city of Eugene, uh, a very large revenue stream. Uh, so we're kind of getting into this impacting a city with home rule jurisdictions stream. Yeah, you know, whatever we can do though, as the Board of Health, um, while working in partnership maybe with those cities is important. Um, but I just have to kind of keep that in mind. I wish we had the ability to enact criminal statutes um, relative to sales to minors. Because if it was up to me, that would be, you know, a mandatory prison sentence. And we, and we would just, you know, drop the hammer on anyone that sells to a minor uh, you know, after, you know, maybe maybe some progressive, you know, there's a first offense or something like that. But if there is a way we could get to that point, that's where it needs to stop. <coughs> Part of our problem is the, entire, the overproduction in this state. I, you know, whether, whatever we control at the retail side, the you know, we are producing, you know, a six-year supply annually in the state. We're only we're only impacting maybe a sixth of the of the actual market when we talk about all these strategies that apply to retailers. So we have to also continue our lobbying with the state about reducing and putting a cap on the production side until we have the ability to a change in national law that allows us to export to states that can't produce like we produce. Because um, the black market, there is no restrictions. They don't care. They don't care, you know, whether it's it it's, you know, looks like candy. They don't care what strength it is. They don't care, you know, what the price is. They're just trying to to, to move it, and and that's where most of it's ending up right now. The place I think you know would be nice if you know, we did with the tobacco retail licensing. It actually funded our ability to go around and enforce. And in fact, you know had one of my constituents complain about the tobacco <laughs> enforcement people because, you know, the difference between nine feet and 10 feet separation from a, a, a door or something for a smoking area for a bar and, and issues like that kind of came up after a while. So trying to figure out where we get that revenue source for enforcement. If we're going to do these things, we need to be able to enforce it. Um, th that's going to be a real... <clears throat> real issue and that's where that that one that final strategy seven there is real important because that may give us that revenue to do enforcement um, so the big issue though for me though is the that complete unawareness now amongst youth that there is a risk with marijuana we have to do something on the public education side you know the the brain development issues with marijuana you know we just finished welcoming our new behavioral health manager yeah you know? One of the biggest risks of that use, use of marijuana as, you know, before your brain's completely developed is adult behavioral health issues, long-term adult behavioral health issues, not to mention just some other issues around, you know, risk-taking and decision-making and everything else that, that goes along with that. Because the last parts of your brain that develop are rational thought and the ability to think about long-term consequences. And if that's what you're impacting with marijuana use as a youth, <clears throat> You're going to be, you know, kind of a problem for society as an adult. You know, so how we get that message out 
how we can talk to people. It's like, you know, it might be fine for a 30 year old to get high once in a while and not really have a long term risk, health risk or whatever. But that 15, 16 year old, you know, regular usage has long term impacts for that person and then for society and how we can get that out there. We've done a great job with tobacco and cancer. Everybody knows there's a risk when you, when you pick up a cigarette that there's a cancer risk. Somehow or another, you know, whether it's, you know, we get the, the Surgeon General to start requiring labeling, you know, <laughs> says, you know, youth usage of, of, of this, you know, has long-term, you know, brain development impact. I, I just can't understand anyone that would use a product that they know could damage their long-term cognitive abilities like that as a youth. But, you know, people don't even understand at risk. So that public education piece has really got to be big. So get off my soapbox. Let somebody else have a chance. Okay. Um, Me? Commissioner Bernie, uh, do you have any remarks on the first round of this uh, work session? Yeah, how long was, um, just out of curiosity, how long was Commissioner Bozovich's remarks? Oh, you, minutes. <laughs> Six minutes and 56 seconds. Um, that was taken out of your first four minutes, seconds. You know, I, I think I, I feel a little set up. I had just said to Commissioner Bozovich, I never want to speak after him at the last round because he always seems to have command of information and details I don't, and the chair has just set me up to do just that. Um, having said that, though, a couple of interactive comments because I don't know some things and then I'll pontificate a little like the rest of the commissioners are want to do. Um, your definition of youth? Uh, anybody under the age of 21. So it's not 18, it's 21. 21. Which is interesting because there's a big move afoot to have 16 year olds and over vote. <laughs> and yet, right? I mean, it's just all these different targets. Okay, thank you. Um, I also am going to my perception, which is based on no data whatsoever, is that a greater, pers something you mentioned about the Green Cross recognition, I would bet, but I don't know, that a greater percentage of high school students know what that Green Cross means than many of us adults. Um, remember you said probably the, um, the and another comment, um, somewhere up there was mentioned that a possibility would be a thousand foot buffer. Was that meant like between dispensaries? Yes, sorry, yeah, and that's what uh, Eugene passed was, I believe the ones that exist, obviously they've allowed them, but for new ones, yes, they wanted a thousand foot buffer between retailers, and part of that is, you probably have noticed, I think the one I can think of is High Street. Um, it seems like there's just like- No pun intended. Poop. Yeah, I know, um, but I think, I don't know if there still is, but there were three just like right in a row there. And so I think there were some concerns about that. Thank you. I would uh, I would request whomever the governing body is, and maybe it's us, and to um, look at what the private sector, like McDonald's or Radio Shacks or other groups have done. I, there's a lot of data in terms of how far away they want one of their stores from another, and it really relates to a market, and it's much further than 1,000 feet. Okay, that now my, if I may, my pontificating. <laughs> um, I think, I agree with all those, well, one more, all those are strategies. So strategies towards what goal? A strategy is meaningless in absence of the goal it's trying to address and reach. What's the goal? Uh, preventing youth use. So complete pre preventive, com all youth use. I would suggest these are more coping strategies than fixing strategies. I think this, th that, that we are reaching a point in our society when looking at things clinically as opposed to holistically in the whole community and what's going on is going to be decreasingly effective, sadly. Um, I think that whether it relates to youth um, overusing or abusing, much less using marijuana, opioids, alcohol, resorting to violence, vandalism, sexual predators, um, et cetera. All of these are indicators that there's some dysfunction out there. And all of these are indicators that unless as a community we have strategies to engage, give people a feeling of 
competence, belongingness, usefulness, that their life is meaningful somehow, that through hard work they in fact can achieve a better future for themselves and others, um, until we look at that sort of community mental health perspective, um, or at least integrated in, we're, we're always going to miss the mark. And the problem will always get bigger than our interventions. So I absolutely support these. I'm just trying to put it in a context, um, and that's my sense of it. And my other sense of it is I'm going, I am absolutely not a libertarian. <laughs> um, I don't think those were libertarian views. <laughs> I absolutely agree that we also have to have a dividing line here somewhere between young people and um, the rest of the, this board of commissioners has children, some of us grandchildren, and, and, and you know, which gives you a, a much, I mean, no, no it, it, it makes you really feel this issue. And, and we've had children that have been, I've had children, a child that has been victim um, of, of some of this stuff. So I just want to um, wish you well, but at the same time, those are my, those are my comments in terms of context. Um. Thank you. Um, I'm going to uh, start another round here because um, I think there were some of us that want to add to uh, what our initial remarks were. And the first thing I'm going to say is I think we have to build in uh, not only the, the, um, the fees for people to help finance this enforcement, but I would go beyond that to education, that we need to have some fees to finance the education. The other thing is that uh, there was reference made to whether or not the Board of Health has authority to enact criminal um, statutes or not, and um, I guess I'm more in favor of enacting a substantial civil penalty because I'm trying to get revenue to um, finance the education and enforcement component, that all of these strategies will fail without any money to have anybody work on this. And, uh, and I think that um, we really have to be uh, focused not only on what we're trying to do, but how we're gonna actually get the money to do it. Um, and uh, as far as whether the Board of Health should or should not uh, cross other boundaries within the county, such as urban growth boundaries, city limits, whatever. Uh, I'm kind of in favor of if, if we've come to the view that these things are gonna protect children, uh, that we ought to impose them countywide and not just you know outside <laughs> of cities. Um, and um, last but not least, you know, um, we had the, the presentations last year on, on tobacco and, and, and before on how marketing of tobacco to children is so effective because they do use Girl Scout cookies. They u do use things that uh, my kids used to and my grandkids probably now uh, pull things off of the bottom shelf <laughs> at the Safeway or Albertsons uh, that look like candy. Um, and, and, and so I think that that was something that was quite quite uh, effective in terms of the public and the board understanding this issue. Uh, so I really think that we, we ought to, you know, think about that and uh, make sure that we are doing what we can to protect kids uh, from this um, uh, trend that we're seeing. And you know, one final thing on this meaningful life concept, that we're here to do more than, than, than simply um, enact ordinances and approve budgets and and praise good people like you guys that are doing a good job. We're, we're here more, in my view, to try to bring about what Commissioner Bernie described as, well, how can we, how can we bring a more meaningful life to the people of this county? Now, some people say, well, the government should have no role in that. <laughs> but I do think the government should have a role in that. And uh, I, I think this, this whole discussion is an example of that. We're not gonna solve the, the inherent fight going on in our, some of our, our citizens' own bodies over whether they think this is good or bad. Uh, we're not gonna solve the problem of government pre preemption, federal preemption, state preemption, whatever. We're not gonna really solve that as it applies to adults. But if we put the focus here on 
people under age as the Oregon statutes currently uh, envision that concept of who's under age, um, then we're more likely to protect uh, these little kids out there and uh, these high school kids and others that are being uh, preyed upon by this advertising. And so we just have to redouble our efforts to make sure that what the voters put in place, and it was very vivid that the drafters of the initiatives to legalize marijuana for adults made it very clear that their number was 21 and Oregon voters voted for that. So I think we should be very clear that what we're doing is trying to protect youth here. Really appreciate your help. And I have taken four minutes and eight seconds to say that. So do we want to have another round or do you think you've got the guidance you need or do commissioners want to make any more comments? Commissioner Farr. I'm not going to say anything about what I already said, which I did not view as pontification. I viewed it as a realistic approach to the issue that's before us. But um, I would like to talk about uh, meaningful life and how do we work with youth in general. Um, Commissioner Bernie said this, these are just coping strategies and not prevention strategies. Of course, mo almost everything we do is a coping strategy because the, uh, the, the machine is already in motion and uh, we're, we're in the process of preventing the machine, machine from continuing. Now, pre prevent uh, with coping with the machine and already in motion, and these strategies are, are very effective. They're lined out in a way that really we can, uh, we can uh, uh, develop tactics that will work, demonstrably have worked with tobacco, demonstrably, I believe, will work with, with the marijuana and uh, access that youth have to marijuana. That is what it's all about in, in this in the situation. As far as taking care of kids in general, of course, first thing we need to do, there should be no homeless kids. That's the end of the conversation. Uh, we'll work from there. Thank you. Thank you. And does anyone else want to be recognized on the second? I have a question for okay, Commissioner Ber uh, Bozovich. So, you know, this question of informed consent comes up often, but I just kind of want to know who currently polices use sales to minors for cannabis? It's LLCC, yeah. And so far, we have seen some reports of, you know, we get, it's publicly acknowledged, it's public, uh, they post it when they do the enforcement for alcohol, right? So they send in somebody who looks young to see if they get carded. And I believe they've done some similar things with the retailers in our county and, and have not found that retailers are selling to, you know, they seem to be doing a pretty good job of carding. I think the concern of how kids are getting it is an adult is going in and buying and then selling it to the kid. The shoulder tap sales. Exactly, yes. Which is where that criminalizing the person that's willing to do the shoulder tap sales is really where we need to, to look at somewhat. But also, do you know how many people are actually tasked with enforcing that with OLCC? How many inspectors do they have for the entire state? I don't know that. I think our perception is not enough. Um. <laughs> I think it's like about three or four, but that's, yeah. yeah they seem pretty overburdened, uh, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Okay, does anyone else wish to be recognized or oh, Mr. Bernie? Okay. My peripheral vision, vision isn't that good either. Um, I've heard several people discuss education and I'd simply like to question what that means um, in the, as it relates to this. Not asking you the question, but making a statement about that. Um, I think sometimes, all too often, we mean by education, um, getting people to behave in ways that we think they ought to behave. And I think what's far more effective, uh, especially, excuse me, get the way we think they ought to behave, but I think that has limited traction to the degree that young people see any hope in their future. And so I just simply want to say, I've, I personally have had good experience only 40 years ago, so it's not like I'm current here. <laughs> I probably would talk about Led Zeppelin as a concert too, but I'm not so sure young people would. Um, so it is, the, is oftentimes, and, and I would encourage you to see if this is even possible, but education that really are projects that are youth initiated to solve um, the problem that's perceived here, allow giving them a structure to come up with 
those projects, identifying some resources for them to implement, um, teaching them that what it means to be an agent of change in a bureaucracy is to take small steps and learn the process of developing common ground and building coalitions and, and acting and measuring the effects of those actions. Um, I think some, sometimes we overlook that that might be more effective than whatever we're somehow referring to as education. And um, oftentimes, I think, uh, we can solve problems by letting young people be the source of the solution or in working with them, develop the sources of the solution and concurrently give them real experiences with democracy. Because in fact, democracy does mean getting involved and having input and being able to have some control into changing for the better one's future. So education. Thank you very much. Do you have other, other uh, commission, Commissioner Buck, do you want to be recognized? Are we, are we done? I'm good. Okay. Karen so, reply to that. so uh, here, here's what I get from this, um, that uh, we've had our work session. Thank you. Um, as was pointed out by one of the commissioners, uh, you guys are doing this important work. Well, just to be clear, it's not you guys that are doing this important work. It's lots of people in the county who are some guys and some not guys. So I just wanted to make that clear that you might have heard that at some point in today's presentation. Uh, so secondly, uh, looks like you have some, some guidance in terms of what to work on. I'm not going to have a great summary of that, but you have the flavor of the work session of what the commissioners have talked about. And um, I am most interested now in a follow-up. When is this coming back? And I'll make a suggestion that you give us an idea and then at least Commissioner Buck and I will, as part of the agenda process, will be processing that. Um, Chair Sorensen, um I'm going to answer your question, then I have another thought I wanted to share as well. Um, I would expect uh, that we can come back to you uh, looking at all of these strategies now that we have a sense of where each of you are. Um, what I would like us to do is have a little bit of time to look at um, staging and what our suggestion would be in terms of how to tee some of these up. It's a large body of work. Um, so think about some sequencing and in terms of readiness statewide and in the community, come back to you with a proposed work plan for that work. Um, and I would imagine we can do that probably in June if that would work for the board just to touch base and say this is what we're thinking in terms of sequencing and work plan. Um, that's not a first reading on an ordinance, um, but that's looking at how would we approach this issue. Does that work for you in terms of time? Sure. Sure. Okay, so that will be our goal to, to come back. And then you wanted to add something. I did. Um, just, uh, I can't see the faces of the people in the audience, but my guess is uh, C.A. Baskerville, who's our prevention supervisor, was smiling hugely uh, when Commissioner Bernie um, posed his remarks around um, really what's the, the problem we're trying to solve in our community and to what extent is marijuana use or opiate use or violence a, a symptom of larger conditions in our community. And I absolutely want to agree with that. I started my career at Lane County 29 years ago as a substance abuse prevention specialist who did um, community organizing uh, throughout small communities in Lane County as well as Eugene Springfield, um, looking at that very issue, um, that these aren't uh, one-off siloed issues, but really there's a larger connection. Um, part of the joy that working in health and human services brings me is being able to really see that constellation and larger picture. So I wanted to assure all of you on the board that um, these policy proposals that we're bringing you as concrete strategies that you as a board of health can do in your lane as a board of commissioners um, is an important part of addressing the um, 
the conditions in our community and it certainly isn't the only thing. And that positive youth development piece is also a key focus in our public health division and throughout health and human services um, to also be tending to that resilience work and that um, building connection in the community that's really gonna um, ultimately help protect our, our children and youth as we move forward. So thank you for lifting that up all. Okay, thank you very much. Just Mr. real Kozovich. quick before we leave the topic, um, Commissioner Bernie brought up such a great point about involving youth, mm -hmm. and I'm going to maybe give Commissioner Buck an assignment here, which she can take her leave. But if she would work with Dr. Maxwell, maybe about contacting the Cottage Grove High School Youth Advisory Committee that they have down there, they did a fantastic job looking at tobacco yeah. and, and youth tobacco prevention to the point where the governor came down and recognized them. Um, I would love to see them engage maybe in, in this issue and maybe make some recommendations back to us from the use perspective. Um, I would that, be happy to, yeah. to make that connection. I think that's a wonderful idea. Yes, and I, I, I appreciate Commissioner Bernie bringing up that aspect of, you know, we're all looking at this from, you know, few years beyond youth <laughs> yeah. and really their perspective is so important and, and you know so I really appreciate that really appreciate Cottage Grove High School has just done a fantastic job with their youth council okay very good and um, I think we're now ready to do something we have wanted to do the agenda teams wanted to do and that is to take a five-minute recess so we can have our breathing Speaking and stretching. <laughs> so we're in a recess. I'm off.
welcome back to the Board of Commissioners. I want to thank uh, Commissioner Buck for, for um, making the suggestion that we periodically do do some stretching and uh, try to uh, model some better um, work, uh, work and health life balance. So let's go back to the top of the whole agenda here, the adjustments to the agenda. Um, are we, let's see, that's item one on our current uh, board of commissioners meeting, page two, for all of you that have. And so on the adjustments to the agenda, Mr. Mo Kreisky, uh what length of, of executive session do we have today? Um, rather lengthy, I'd say we have about an hour, Steve, not more than an hour and a half, possibly. Okay. And is that going to be today? Yeah, okay. And are you envisioning that for the afternoon at this point? Okay. Uh, so we need to do, do we have any emergency business? No. No. So we need to do the consent calendar. I see Mr. Fox is here. Mr. Mokreisky, do you think we should do the uh, consent calendar first or the, or the uh, item involving Mr. Fox? Well, I would say if you want to do consent calendar and then 8A is a is a quick item, and Ms. Gaffney is here for that one. Okay. And then we, you can jump right into 9B. Okay. So I think in the next five to 10 minutes, we can be to okay. Fox and Mr. Dane. So let's uh, go to item seven. That's our consent calendar. Um, and I know I, I didn't call for any commissioners that had anything to take off the consent calendar, but at this time, are there any commissioners that want to take anything off of the consent calendar? Okay. Seeing uh, no items Requested off, uh, I'll entertain a motion to approve the consent calendar. So moved. Second. Okay, it's so moved by Commissioner Bernie, seconded by Commissioner Buck to approve the consent calendar as presented. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed say no. Motion carries five to zero. Uh, all commissioners voting in the affirmative. Uh, and then the next item, uh, Ms. Gaffney, if you could come forward, is item 8A. This is order 09-03-19-05 in the matter of approving certain contracts and amendments and deleting authority to the county administrator to approve the, uh, to sign the approved contracts and amendments. Um, and uh, thank you, Ms. Gaffney, for being present. Mr. Chair, I'm sorry if I missed this, but did you recess the Board of Health and convene the Board of Commissioners? I believe so. Okay. Yeah. Did you hear that? You want me to okay. do it again? No, if you, well, I well, just let's didn't do it catch again. It, so I'm reconvening the meeting of the Lane County Board of Commissioners. We, we actually had a joint meeting, so we're, we were right. still meeting. But, okay. Okay. Still me. Um, Very good. <laughs> Chair Sorensen yeah, and commissioners. Um, this item is actually a relatively short item. Um, Every month we bring to you a list of contracts and amendments that are moving through. Um, and if we have any new items as opposed to just renewals or amendments, um, we don't put that on your consent calendar. We actually give you the opportunity to ask any questions you might have. So in front of you in the order today is um, a request for authorization for three specific amendments and then one new contract, which is for our pharmacy, in-house pharmacy that's located at Lane County Behavioral Health. So there isn't any particular controversy around any of these. It's your opportunity to ask any questions you might have and then give us authority to move forward. Okay. Any commissioners have any questions regarding this matter or make a motion? I'll make a motion to approve item 8A, order 19-03-1905-05, um, in the matter of approving certain contracts and amendments and delegating authority to the county administrator to sign the approved contracts and amendments. Okay, is there a second? Second. Okay, it's been moved and second to approve the uh, order as presented. Any further discussion, comments? Seeing none. Go to a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, say no. Motion carries five to zero. All commissioners voting in the affirmative. Okay, uh, next we will invite up Mr. Fox and Mr. Dingle for item 9B, <clears throat> and that is our work session on ballot measure 102. Um, 
last year, the board uh, and later following it, the board <clears throat> asked for a, a work session and briefing on uh, ballot measure 102 and Mr. Um, Kyler and Mr. Dingle uh, were involved in that and then uh, we have now set up this work session to uh, talk about measure 102 and we were informed that Mr. Fox is one of the premier um, people that knows about this. So I'll just turn it over to Mr. Dingle and Mr. Fox and however you wanna divide the time is, is good. Uh, Chair Sorensen and members of the board, I'll be very brief. Um, I think really the, the most of the question is gonna be from Mr. Fox. Just to provide some background, <clears throat> this was, I think actually what happened is the city of Portland went ahead and had actually raised some money for this and realized there was a constitutional restriction on a uh, public entity's body, ability to um, essentially go into business with private uh, folks with bond, bond dollars. And actually this kind of grows out of, this has been in the Oregon Constitution since forever, and that's because early on a lot of governmental entities went into business with uh, companies like railroads and whatnot, and they went bankrupt. So this basically was a prohibition against uh, the public investing in those sorts of things. Over time, there have been various exceptions carved out. You'll notice in the constitutional provision that for ports and different things, but to do the kind of partnership that <clears throat> folks wanted to do around affordable housing, the Constitution had to be amended. So that's, that's what happened with Measure 102. I'm also here on behalf of uh, Assessor Coles. Uh, he is up in <clears throat> Multnomah County right now uh, looking at a new computer system for assessment and taxation. But included in the materials were, were some assessed value and essentially what he wanted me to convey to you is, and the only thing he would be saying is there's no way the county's ever gonna hit the limit in terms of, there's lots and lots of theoretical money out there in the sense of the limit uh, because of the assessed value of real property in, in Lane County. And my only comment as council is one of the things that, I, and I mentioned this to Mr. Mokrahyski, that's a little concerning to me is that the legislature, when they did this, did not define affordable housing. I think that's probably because they couldn't agree on it. Uh, I suspect that when people go out and start actually doing these bond measures, that's where the legal challenges are gonna come in. Because the, the phrase affordable housing by, by the constitutional amendment has to be defined in the measure that seeks the bonds. And I think that's where you're gonna see people you know, you come up with this board, if they decided, you decided to do this, you would come up with the definition of affordable housing. Uh, I could see people who disagreed with that challenging it in court. And that's really all I have. The rest of it, I think, is Mr. Fox explaining how he thinks this can work and how it might not work. So I'll turn it over to him. Okay. Please proceed. Uh, thanks, uh, Chair Sorensen, uh, Commissioners. Uh, so kind of in the spirit of full disclosure, being a no-nonsense person, I'm actually not an expert in um, sort of jurisdictional bonding, uh, but I can kind of speak to my experience in the affordable housing world and the discussions and connections that I have with other communities that have been successful in passing similar bonds. Uh, so just a little bit of background, in 2012, uh, the Whatcom County in Washington kind of was the leader in the Pacific Northwest in terms of going to the voters and um, securing their support for a bond issuance that would uh, target affordable housing production primarily. Uh, Clark County and uh, actually the city of Portland uh, went to the voters in 2016, and uh, both of those were successfully uh, approved by voters. Um, as uh, Steve mentioned, the um, prior to um, the 102 passing, uh, there was constitutional issues as it relates to how affordable housing is financed, uh, meaning um, the bond issuer, the jurisdiction, had to have an ownership interest in the property and that wouldn't allow uh, us to leverage uh, typical affordable housing uh, tools like the low income housing tax credit. Obviously that's been changed. 
Uh, and then uh, this last uh, November, uh, the metro area, so Multnomah County, Washington County, and Clackamas County uh, also went to the voters and secured almost a $700 million bond. Uh, I kind of went a little bit deeper as it relates to Clark County because I feel like that's something of a comparator for us. Uh, so they um, they secured voter approval for 36 cents per thousand of assessed value. Uh, that results in uh, about $6 million a year um, over a six-year period of time. And they project that to uh, be able to deliver 3,300 units into Clark County. Um, so sort of bringing... Uh, Bringing the concept down to Lane County is um, definitely something that I think is the responsibility of our community. As the executive director of a public corporation, I can't uh, really lobby or advocate, um, but I can um, speak in a factual um, basis towards the need in the community. Uh, getting um, a, a new resource for affordable housing funding I think is critical uh, for the citizens of Lane County that are struggling to pay rent. <clears throat> um, and I guess the other thing I would say before I, um, before I just take any questions you might have is that um, I am concerned about jurisdictional capacity um, as it relates to um, developing uh, kind of a strategic plan for implementing uh, funds. Should we go to the voters and get that approved? In looking at other communities, I, I really feel like that's a big flaw, is that other communities have gone to the voters, but they didn't really have a detailed kind of implementation plan in place. Uh, so it's often taken other communities kind of a year, year and a half to get those um, sort of production systems up and running. Uh, kind of a parallel that I think uh, we're experiencing right now is that the um, state of Oregon has never invested more funds in the affordable housing space. Uh, and um, I frankly think that um, the city of Eugene is doing a great job, but I don't think they have the capacity to really um, kind of support uh, bringing as much investment as possible to Lane County uh, or to the city of Eugene in that context. Again, they're not doing anything wrong, but the amount of funds that are out there uh, does require jurisdictions to have um, capacity to support organizations like Homes for Good or St. Vinnie's and getting units on the ground. So with that, I would take any questions you have. Okay, uh, why don't we start with Commissioner Bernie, move in this direction to Commissioner Bozovich and around to Commissioner Buck and then last with me. Um, I always, a couple of just quickies. Um, you mentioned Clark County and I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but you said that uh, a bond was approved which cost $36 per year per household? Uh, no, 36 cents. 36 cents per, per thousand. Thousand of assessed value. Right, and it yielded, thank you, and it yielded six million a year? Correct. And then did you say that that financed 3,300 units? Uh, no, great question. So it's over a period of six years. Uh, so it's um, the six million times six, 36 million. Right, right, but how many units then was 3, that? 3,300. Okay. My math has to be wrong, and it won't be the first time, but I come to just under $11,000 a unit. Yeah, so the way that these these funds are used is what we in the business call gap financing. So um, just using, let's use Market District Commons as an example. Uh, so we'll break ground on that next month. It's a $16 million project. Uh, we secured about... 13 million from the state, which means we had to secure 3 million from other sources. So these uh, proceeds, if ever implemented in our community, would be used for what's called gap financing. Okay, so they incented that many units, but they did not finance them themselves. Correct. Um, this is a really dumb question. I apologize. It may be, I don't know who it would be directed to, but what is Lane County's bonding capacity and assuming the courthouse bond is approved how much does that give us to quote unquote play with i think that well 
I think that's a question best directed at Ms. Moody, but I think what, at least what uh, Assessor Coles told me is that there was still plenty of room, if you will. Whatever that means. Yes. We, we, we have very little <laughs> okay. existing debt. Yes, that's. Um, and even after the courthouse, there would be, so we can get that number for you. But no, there, thank there you. You see where I'm coming from, but yeah, no, that, I got it. I think and Robert Tindall could provide that information too. And, and then um, my last question, unless I'm senile and forgot it. Oh, yes. And, and, prop, and the, again, question, prop is this 102, um, that will also allow um, partnering with private firms, correct? Absolutely. So it will, be interesting, it will be interesting to see how that opens up opportunities to specifically provide low-income housing um, and at the same time, uh, give them a margin where they're comfortable unleashing their dollars. And if we get there, I'd love to help because I, I have done that with other things. <laughs> Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Commissioner Bozovich. Thank you. So, you know, we had some public testimony this morning about the, the purchasing of, of what were considered one source of low income housing by a large corporation and then 10% uh, rate increase, rent increases. Um, so yeah, I have some concern about the, the idea of, of private ownership and, and setting these up for private ownership and the, and the transferability of them in the future purchase and then they become not so affordable housing. Um, I understand that, you know, when we, at least on the homes for good side, when we set up a lot of these projects, we have to form separate LLCs to get the tax credit money funneled in and everything. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there's private ownership involved with that LLC. Um, before Measure 102, we could do bond measures that would build affordable housing as long as they stayed in public ownership. Can you kind of maybe give me a little bit of distinction of are the LLCs that we set up you know, through Homes for Good, are they publicly owned LLCs and, and considered public ownership or are they private ownership? Um, that's a great question, Jay. Um, so uh, the LLCs that we set up um, at the front end of a project are, are controlled by the private sector for the most part. So again, using Market District Commons as an example, uh, Wells Fargo actually owns 99.9% .9 of that LLC. Um, the public or Homes for Good actually is um, called the general partner. So we actually control all activities of that LLC and we're responsible for all the compliance and hoops that come with developing affordable housing. So that structure exists until um, year, what's called year 15. So that's when your uh, investor has um, secured all the tax credits depreciation and losses over that 15 year period. And then they exit the partnership in which, at which time we put it into an LLC that we control wholly. Which would be a public ownership ultimately. Correct. So is it that temporary private partner for uh, that 15 years that, that, now this is probably more of a question for Mr. Dingle, is that what Measure 102 was trying to get around? Because I, I, I have concerns about public bonding being used to, to basically benefit private entities. But this, this arrangement where after 15 years it's public ownership, I don't have an issue with. Well, that's what it was designed to get. Because it, in the situation that Mr. Fox just described, everything works out well. Here it's theoretically possible that the project could go. So it, it, it's incumbent upon us as a board if we use this tool to try and set it up similar to what's traditionally been used for tax credits, where there is a reversion to public ownership at the end of some period, um, pure public ownership, where we wouldn't want to have this suddenly become a market rate on the market sellable uh, property. Right. Uh, Chair Sorensen, Commissioner Bozovich, I think that's part of the issue when, remember when I, at the beginning of my remarks I said, <clears throat> one of my concerns that I had was that they didn't really define affordable housing. And I think that's part of what's going to have to go into that. It, it, when an entity goes out for this, I think it's going to have to say, this is what the um, 
this is what the structure is, and it's going to remain in, you know, the public domain for X. That is one of the things that is um, sometimes difficult for people to wrap their head around, which is what do you, what happens at the end of 15 or 20? Who owns it? Yeah. And how does the public, if the, if the public puts up the bonds, are they, do they get part of the money? You know, I mean, that's, that's all things that have to be decided at the front end, in my opinion. I could just briefly add to that. Um, there are a couple private sector developers of affordable housing in the state of Oregon, and quite frankly, they, they do a really good job. Um, they, um, they're, they're really long-term owners, so when you bring tax credits into a property, you're committing to the state of Oregon to keep it affordable for 60 years. So I'm not as sensitive to um, private organizations potentially developing affordable housing because they're making that long-term commitment. So the tax credit finding, financing would definitely tie the 60 years. So if we're using it as gap financing for tax credit financing, that would give that guarantee. That, that's, that's really what I'm looking for is how can we make sure whatever we do with, if we choose to use this tool, stays affordable and doesn't end up on the market being sold, resold, and then eventually 10% rent hikes annually. Yeah, and, and, and you as a regulating body, uh, should the voters approve it, would also have the ability to put in those sort of long-term uh, conditions into your investment as well. Great, thank you. Okay, uh, Commissioner Farr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, um, Jacob, thank you for a, a great presentation. You, you consider yourself not an expert. I, I look to you for expert opinions on so many things, including um, your experience in this field uh, in the Portland metro area, for instance, uh, it's been invaluable to the work that we do as Homes for Good and as a Board of County Commissioners. Thank you for that. Um, that being said, um, this is a, a, a work session for the Board of County Commissioners. It's only going to do good if the if the information that we talk about and the, dis, uh, the dialogue that we have is reported and that more people hear it than just us. I'm not going to go into any great depth on the on the mechanism that is that 102 provides. Um, I love it. Uh, that's all I'll say. But the, what I will go into great depth on is something that we do talk about often, the public is beginning to understand more and more often, and um, that is surrounding the general uh, housing uh, emergency that we have in the state, and not just in the Portland region, throughout the state, and not just in Eugene Springfield, but throughout the state. Um, Echo Northwest, I heard, uh, conducted, com completed a report in October of 2018, um, and it's called Homelessness in the Portland Region, Review of Trends, etc. And once again, it's the port I would consider as the Portland region, and um, it talks about high rents, but it also talks very significantly about inventory of housing. And while we're, uh, we can talk about the mechanics of, uh, of um, ballot measure 102, I trust we're moving forward with the uh, adequate use of the mecha mechanics, but let's continue to elevate people's attention regarding the need for such uh, tools as what uh, 102 provides. Uh, accelerated housing production at all price points would make, a re would make reductions in the likelihood of homelessness for large numbers of people. So we have to keep it, our eye on that ball. We need to focus on accelerated housing production at all levels. Now, whether it's at uh, low income levels, affordable housing levels, however you may define those things, it really is at all levels that we need to focus on, on producing housing with emphasis on the, uh, on the lower priced housing that gets more and more people into housing. So uh, this report from Echo Northwest states that Oregon has 1.3% of the nation's population, yet 2.6% of the nation's homeless. We're double national average. Uh, uh, the percentage of homelessness is reflective of our housing crisis. Now, the housing crisis isn't only affecting people who are homeless, it's affecting people who are marginally housed or in danger of becoming homeless or, or, or less, uh, less stably housed. So at all times, Mr. Fox, we need to focus on something that you do every day with your entire staff. We need to focus on how do we make more housing available to more people. And one of the tools that we have is to accelerate housing production. I talk about it all the time. It's a broken record, but it's one that we need to talk about continually. No matter how we discuss, whatever we discuss, um, we have a health in all policies uh, uh, policy at, uh, at Lane County. So every time we have an agenda item, it, we need to have the health imp implication. A part of that health in all policies is this, housing. So we need to make certain that every time we talk about things that we do, how is it going to affect housing? And right now we're talking directly about 
ballot measure one or two and how it potentially can provide more housing production. I'm reading quotes here. Um, but uh, also we need to focus that inward, Mr. Mokrahyski, on how do we make certain that every time we look at anything, how does it affect our accelerated housing production? So thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Commissioner. Thank you for the for giving us the facts that you got. It was um, I was not sure what the bonding capacity would be, I, and I'm very conscious of making sure we don't have taxpayer fatigue. Um, at the same time, as a housing advocate, I really want to know uh, what the possibilities are, um, because a, a lot of of the housing talk we speak here um, is metrocentric, yet we have a huge need in our rural communities as well. So even if the city of Eugene or the city of Springfield has some housing um, funding availability, it's very it's limited to the metro area. And um, it's very important to me that we think holistically about the entire county and what we could possibly do for more rural areas as well. Um, I do agree about the, the capacity issue. Um, they, these types of projects um, take specialized developers, specialized uh, grant writers, and they're um, in hot demand. Does the bonding allow for capacity in that sense as well, or just the actual physical buildings built? Um, great question, Heather. And I actually, um, well, I do know that there's an administrative um, amount that is um, used by sort of the issuing jurisdiction, um, but I don't have specifics about, so for Clark County or Wacom, how much is that? Um, but I certainly can, can find out. I mean, one of the things I was going to um, propose is I know a, a few people that have been sort of right in the middle of um, setting these things up and, and working with uh, voters and communities. Um, so that'd be another thing that um, I could help with is bringing those folks here for um, a more granular session. Um, but great question. I, I'll get you just a rough answer, at least for Clark County and send it to you via email. That would be great. And um, I would also say that your thoughts about um, more specificity around a plan for rural Lane County is, is music to my ears. Um, and it's definitely something that we'll be working on uh, during the update of the Homes for Good strategic plan, which you'll all obviously get a lot of time um, to engage with us on what that would look like. Great. I'm very familiar with the tax credit programs that um, you've done in the past and, and the mechanisms. I do know that if this is something we continue to discuss, which I would encourage, that uh, when or if we put this out um, for um, something concrete in the future, it would have to have some serious sidebars on it because um, it is important that it remain low income in perpetuity for a, uh, a long time. It's also something that we know that people can't take advantage of the money. It's really supposed to be used as leverage, as, as you described for Clark County, in matching with other dollars that people bring to the projects. But I also want to make sure that um, there's ways in which we can limit it to um, you, know, uh, you know, certain developers that we know have good reputations, um, people that are uh, using local vendors to build the projects. So that would need a much more flesh out um, discussion and curious if this is something for our um, housing committee to maybe discuss in more depth and be able to come back with some more information. Seems like it's um, it, their prime subject and I'm sure they're already talking about it. I would be interested in what they have to say as well. Mr. Chair. Yes. There's, um, unless there were other questions from commissioners or comments, um, I'm happy to provide some information around the question of our debt capacity. That was that was raised. So um, our general obligation uh, debt limit is based is two percent of our real market value. Our real market value is forty about forty two point five billion dollars in Lane County. So two percent uh, is about eight hundred and fifty million dollars. This uh, 
Measure 102 under paragraph one, section nine, sub D uh, allows for uh, a not to exceed one half of 1%. So one ha half of 1% would be around 200, something like $210 million, okay? So that's our capacity. Of course, the, the primary question then is how do you pay off the debt that we would issue? So the, the funding source is still a question, but in terms of our general obligation debt capacity, something in the range of $200 million, and then we have additional capacity for non-general obligation bonds, which I don't have. Thank you. Um, I'll just take a, a part of the first round on this to say, um, I, I feel very strongly about this. The Oregon voters passed this measure in November. Um, I worked for it, um, but even if I hadn't worked for it, I would think that local governments, cities and counties, who are the I issuers, not Homes for Good, not uh, a nonprofit group, but, but governments, uh, local governments are allowed to issue these bonds. And it seems to me that we would want to, given the number of housing issues there are in this state, we would want to jump on this. So I, I feel like, yeah, it doesn't, this doesn't solve our high income housing, it doesn't solve our low income housing, doesn't solve our homeless housing, doesn't solve our middle income housing. It only attempts to solve one thing, and that's affordable housing, okay? So the drive here is, if we want to do something about affordable housing, this is a tool in the toolbox that the voters have given us. And in my view, we do face an affordable housing issue in this community, and we ought to begin working with either lenders, developers, or other private sector people who the constitutional amendment is aimed at. It's not aimed at, at, at nonprofit groups. It's not aimed at the federal government or the state government to give more money for housing. It's aimed at getting private parties involved with government, with government issuers. And so what I want to see happen here is I want to see us take some action. I want us to move towards an action where Lane County, as a, a potential issuer, as a lawful <coughs> issuer, starts putting together a proposal for affordable housing in this community. And obviously uh, the lawyers will help us uh, with the definition of the term affordable housing, but, but we really need to get on this and not talk about solving an affordable housing problem, but actually, you know, really do something here that we have this tool. And I wanna ask um, specifically, um, uh, could we put together a rural and urban and suburban affordable housing uh, proposal so that we can assess whether or not there's voter buy-in for that. Because remember, uh, for the board and public following this, uh, a perfect proposal can be uh, initiated by a public issuer, such as city or county. But if the voters of that jurisdiction do not approve it by at least a majority vote, it's not going anywhere. So we need to really uh, get on board right now with, I mean, this measure passed six months ago. Uh, my feeling is, where is the proposal? What can we do? What does Lane County as an entity or Homes for Good helping Lane County to become an issuer and to make sure that we're solving some of these uh, rural affordable housing issues, urban house affordable housing issues that otherwise have not been addressed with all the other tools that are out there. This is a new tool, brand new tool, <clears throat> And we really ought to be uh, jumping on it. And I'd like to know what, what do you think the appropriate follow-up would be for this? Uh, Mr. Fox. Um, great question, Pete. Um, first, I'd just say that I really kind of support your vision that there needs to be urgency. Um, at the same time, I think going to the voters is something that's delicate. Uh, I know that Heather and I both live in rural Lane County, and I need to be able to go to my neighbor Bill and explain to him why he's going to pay more property taxes for affordable housing in rural Lane County. And to be honest, I, I can pitch the idea all day long, but unless it really means something to rural voters, I, I don't think we'll be successful. Unless we have projects to point to. And, and I think they're coming around. Um, so in answer to your question, this is this is something that Lane County um, 
needs to lead, I'll do whatever I can in using my professional connections and my experience in terms of what, um, what production could result from something like this. Uh, so I think um, both uh, Steve Mokraiski and Steve Dingle know that I'll help in any way um, that I can, so. Okay, thank you. Uh, do other commissioners want to have a second round or are we done? Commissioner Farr, go ahead. I'll just state that uh, the urgency surrounding housing has been, been here for a long time. We've not been particularly effective at coalescing on, on plans. In uh, 1997, uh, we had a council committee to finance affordable housing, the Eugene City Council, and we came up with a proposal. It was a 1% utility tax, which we presented to the uh, the, vot the voters in Eugene only, and it would have been a 1% tax on utility fees. would have been about a buck a month per family. It was rejected by 72%. Now, that 1% utility fee would have, would have given us a, a great capacity for revenue stream bonding. We could have bonded against that. It would have produced about a million dollars a year, 1997. So we have ways to look at things that aren't necessarily, um, that haven't, that aren't necessarily new, that may have been looked at before. The ways to uh, finance affordable housing that goes beyond ballot measure 102. We have lots and lots of ways to do it. And for us to be particularly reactive today, say, hey, we need to do something about affordable housing. Uh, putting forward the point that maybe we haven't already and maybe it's not something that we've been focusing on, that's a pretty disingenuous. We need to continue the work that we've been doing for many, many, many years while continuing to coalesce around, uh, around multi-jurisdictional work, uh, both inside and outside of urban growth boundaries. There's a lot of work been done already. Sometimes it's uh, not evident to some people. Uh, but the work has been done, and we just need to once again coalesce and make certain that we use all the tools that are available to... Uh, as Echo Northwest says, accelerate the production of housing. Okay, um, Commissioner Buck, you're next. Go for it. So I wanted to ask fellow commissioners and um, staff what they felt about the proposal of asking our housing committee to look at this more in depth and, and find um, some more active ways to perhaps per pursue this. Is that, is, um, I, I think that's an appropriate means to give some direction to keep the ball moving. I was just wondering how my fellow commissioners felt about that. The Housing Committee? Housing Policy Board. Right. Yeah. The Housing Policy Board. Okay. I, that was at the last meeting. Um, I, I agree with it. As long as we, 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 the Poverty and Homelessness Board also has a uh, shelter and support <clears throat> housing development committee that actively meets and has proposed uh, some uh, some... Uh, ideas specifically rega regarding supportive housing. So uh, that the Housing Policy Board is intergovernmental. Well, I would just, um, Springfield's not at that table. Um, and In a way they are. <laughs> right, sorry. Um, <laughs> sorry, Springfield yeah. has a renewed presence at the table. Um, uh, but I, what I would say is just in my experience attending that meeting, Pat, you correct me if I'm wrong, um, not a lot of focus on rural Lane County. So that's that's my historically, Good. historically, yeah. correct. So uh, I'm going to rule that Ms. Uh, Commissioner Buck's time is still running. You want to add anything else? No. Okay. Okay. So let's see here. Who's up next? Uh, Joe and then, Joe and then uh, Jay. Yeah. Um, in terms of your request. I would be delighted <laughs> if that's the will of the, the board. Um, I've had I've gone to one of those meetings thus far, and my perception is it's somewhat Eugene centric, uh, but that doesn't mean it has to be. Uh, what I wanted to say also was that um, I see this as an opportunity to be a little more global and. Um, and attract some additional resources into a discussion of all levels of housing um, in Lane County. I think that a tool that could bring in some heads of investment funds as part of a discussion, not to take over, but as part of a discussion of how funds can be leveraged um, would be really useful. And I'd love an excuse to see if I couldn't get a person or two to come up here. Um, I think that 
we might be a little too uh, quick at the at the at the trigger finger to say, hey, this is a new tool. We haven't done, let's do this. Of course it's a new tool. But I think there's an opportunity to, if we can create some housing that maybe for 20 years is low income and then does convert, and some housing that's low income um, in perpetuity, yeah, and leverage other opportunities to then bring in some other developers that, that we don't have, obviously you're gonna have an RFQ and an RFP for developers, but it would be great to increase the size of the pie um, as opposed to, you. I just see this as a heck of an opportunity. So whatever the appropriate mechanism to move this forward, I'm a thousand percent for it and I will bring it up um, if this board directs me to at the next housing policy committee. Thank you. Uh, does anyone else want to speak? Jay, go ahead. So I'll try and be quick. Um, reaching back to previous agenda item, we're all talking about coping strategies, not really about getting down to the root issues of this, this problem, one of which is inventory of housing in this, in this area. Um, I um, do think it is a tool, though, that we can utilize, but I think it's something we need to, to have a discussion around our overall toolbox. We have a work session tomorrow on our strategic plan. I think this is a real appropriate topic to be, be talking about tomorrow. Mr. Chair, if I, can I just piggyback off of that comment real sure. quickly? I wanted to share with the board that uh, as it relates to our strategic plan, the first item under Safe and Healthy County Strategic Initiative Affordable Housing and Homelessness, we have a, uh, an identified um, key initiative that is to develop a, that the board has already approved, to develop a multi-jurisdictional affordable housing plan. The idea was to, to work as a region um, to, to pull together a plan. Um, I forget which commissioner made this comment about, I think Commissioner Farr, that we haven't done a very good job of, of as a community regionally uh, focusing on that. So uh, we are working on that and I think the extent, if the board certainly would like to have an assignment for us to engage with the Housing Policy Board for uh, yeah. Poverty and Homelessness Board or others in that effort certainly can do that. But I, I agree tomorrow is probably a good time for us to talk about does that action item, uh, is it relevant today? Do you want to expand it or change it? Um, but I just wanted to call that out that we actually, we do have an item that we've been working on as it relates to developing that sort of multi-jurisdictional plan. Thank you. Um, if we read the strategic plan. I'll just say that in my uh, comments on this, I, I want to make it really clear that when the Oregon voters and when the Constitution's been amended for a new concept, and Commissioner Bernie hit on it, and that is, this is for affordable housing. This is not for homelessness. This is not for high income housing problems. This is for affordable housing, and that is something that we will probably have to grapple with as to what the definition is. But be that as it may, this is a new technique, a new way of financing housing. In the past, we've had, I will just say, two methods, one public, one private. This merges public and private. This is a new technique to allow credit unions, banks, and other people to help finance projects. It allows private developers to obtain publicly funded bond measure, bonds that taxpayers pay for. And so the idea that we would be able to uh, solve every housing problem with this, it's not, but it's aimed at something new. It's a technique and it's gotta be done very carefully because it hasn't been done. I'm not aware that there's a, a jurisdiction out there yet that's done this not even the jurisdictions that usually pioneer trying to help people like Benton County, Corvallis, Portland, Multnomah County, et cetera. In my view, we could really be doing something to the benefit of our rural and urban constituents, something that, that would address an affordable housing issue that's out there. And I just wanna encourage us to keep the focus on not housing, but affordable housing, because that's what this ballot measure is all about, doing something about the difficulty of Oregonians to reach affordable housing. And that is the component here that, that, that I'm, 
I really want to emphasize that I think we do have private sector partners out there who, with a little bit more money, could make an affordable housing project go. And uh, that's, that's the public role. And to say to our neighbors, whether their name is Hal or, what was your neighbor? <laughs> Bill. Bill, Hal or Bill, my neighbor Hal, why should I vote for this? Your neighbor Bill, why should you vote for it? And the answer is because we've made a list of 15 projects and they're all affordable housing projects and we have private entities that are putting up their money to do this, okay? And we wanna make sure that it goes. And so we've put up the, the matching money in the form of bonds and this will all be paid off over time at a reasonable rate, not a huge rate, and it'll inure to the benefit of our community and address a problem we've got. Um, so anyway, uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate this work session. I really look, I think Mr. Moker Heist had a great idea and it is to pull that into our strategic plan. Um, and so anyway, thank you very much. Um, anything else from you guys on the work session or I think we've concluded it. Um, did you want to say something, Steve? Steve Dingle? No. Didn't you have your hand up? Say, I, I want to say I'm something. Trying to get you to write. Okay. I didn't know if you saw Commissioner yeah. Bernie, that's all. Oh, oh, you didn't know if I saw him. Yeah, thank you. Much appreciated, sir. Yeah, no, I, and by the way, I'll just extend that to Mr. Mokreisky, too, because you're right, I, I do have some mobility issues. I can't really oh, see. No, I'm not kidding. I, I can't always see everybody, so. All right, so, uh, Mr. Mokreisky, if we go back to our adjustments to the agenda, uh, I'm kind of hearing we should come back for our regular session and the items in the sequence, we've got them, and then add on Ms. Um, uh, Ms. Uh, Moody, I believe, yeah, her uh, presentation after that. Is that a fair summary, or do you know if Ms. Moody has some? Yeah, she's uh, flexible, so we can do that. I wanted to update the board. It sounds like our exec session is, is tracking probably more like two and a half hours. Oh. So um, I was mistaken. I think I told you an hour and a half. So okay. I don't want you to have a false expectation. There, there are a number of items. Uh, that I think there's a land use item, uh, three bargaining updates, and the OP. So, so uh, my sense is we're <clears throat> about to uh, recess, and we'll have county administration and our uh, our uh, sheriff and, and others here at 1.30, <clears throat> and then we'll have our floodplain, then we will uh, have Ms. Moody, and then we'll have executive session. If we don't finish executive session, we'll carry it over to the executive session tomorrow. Uh, Chair uh, Sorensen, uh, I would uh, ask if I could do my, I have some brief announcements. Okay. It will just uh, uh, take us to the lunch hour. All right, let's uh, move then to- 9A. Item number 9A. And uh, that will be our uh, county council announcements. Please proceed. All right. The first thing I want to mention is the co the board had been asking for regular updates on the uh, DCBS uh, invest uh, inspector issue, building building official issue, and I think I forwarded to you last Friday. The attorney general finally issued the long-awaited opinion, uh, number eight two nine six. With, and I think I sent, also sent out a little bit of an explanation, but just to uh, sort of highlight that, um, it's sort of, it is a mixed bag. Basically, I think what the AG is saying is that the authority can be delegated. There needs to be a statutory fix, which I'm confident someone, Rob Bavet on behalf of AOC, and I think Alex Kyler on behalf of the counties is working to do. Basically, what they're saying is you can delegate this authority. There has to be certain protections, in other words. There has to be an appeal, there has to be, you know, you can't completely, uh, a legislative body can't completely abdicate its responsibilities to a private uh, contractor. Uh, the second thing I wanted to mention was there was a comment made in public comment about uh, uh, property <clears throat> taken from the Camp 99 uh, uh, area. Let me just, first of all, factually, um, we did, at the time that the uh, uh, Camp 99 was disbanded, we did, we meaning Lane County, did agree to store the property for 30 days, which would have been up in early February. Uh, we did specifically extend that date until early March, so it was more than 60 days at that point. Mr. Johns contacted 
um, a number of multiple channels uh, uh, to, to campers indicating that the property was going to be disposed of if it wasn't picked up. <coughs> he specifically mentioned Chris McAllister. Uh, when they did go in and look at the property, there was a lot of it that was um, presented as severe health hazard, mold, <coughs> rat inf and rat infestation, and so it was uh, severely contaminated and was no value of no value and it was disposed of. I did want to correct something. Um, the gentleman in uh, public comment kept talking about the Lavin decision. That's Lavin et al. versus the City of Los Angeles, 693 F3rd 1022 2012. And it is a Ninth Circuit opinion. It doesn't have any application to this. That was the City of Los Angeles was sued for violating a temporary restraining order that they'd entered it that had been imposed on them or I believe actually negotiated. That's where the 90 days comes from. It was a term in the temporary restraining order. And the underlying litigation dealt with the uh, City of Los Angeles's um, procedure or policy of unilaterally confiscating unattended property on public property and destroying it on the spot. So that was what was at issue in that case. And then they got sued for that conduct. They entered into a restraining order, a, a TRO, a temporary restraining order, uh, which contained this provision that they would do, they would hold on to this property for 90 days. Uh, and if, and again, I, I don't, I apologize, I don't have the F3rd site, but I can certainly provide this if any board members interested. But this really dealt with taking property and as the, the quote is, as we've repeatedly made clear, the government may not take property like a thief in the night. Rather, it must announce its intentions and give the property owner a chance to argue against the taking. That has no application at all whatsoever to this circumstance because the people voluntarily turned over their property to Lane County. We didn't confiscate it. We voluntarily took it. And we're in compliance with the only other statute that applies in Oregon is, and it really doesn't apply here either, is um, ORS 203079 sub uh, 1D, which is a statute that was enacted, um, I think in 1995 or 1999, that requires when government governmental entities come in and um, uh, clean up or disband a camp, that they have to post a sign that tells people where their property is going to be picked up and that it and they have to retain it for 30 days unless it's a health hazard or unless it's of no apparent value. That really doesn't apply here either. That was intended for circumstances where authorities went to a camp and the people weren't there. Then the people returned and the camp was gone. That obviously isn't the circumstance here. We went to great lengths um, uh, when we took the property, uh, when we when the pe people gave us the property, you recall it was bagged up and then individually identified. We knew who the owners were is the point I was saying. It's it's not a situation where we didn't know who the property belonged to. So I just wanted to clarify that. And that's Thank all you. I have. Thank you very much. And we're in a recess till 1.30. Thank you. And if any one of the board members wants that, I'll say.